I'm just grateful to be here with you guys. I mean, this is a really fun topic. We've had a great day so far. Those of you that spoke beforehand, like, you know, you we were talking about like your first one, man, you guys crushed it. Absolutely awesome to hear from you. Because I remember, again, my first, you know, lectures going out, I was scared out of my freaking mind, you know, like had multi pair of underwear in my bag in case I soiled myself and things of that nature because it was scary as I'll get out. But it, it, it's just so cool to watch you all, you know, presenting stuff and whatnot. So I, re I really have enjoyed the day and thank you very much for having me because I love peers. We have peers every year. This is like the first year in North America we're not having peers. And it's a real bummer because it's such a fun time to get together as a group and just be able to discuss things frankly and debate things and different things of that nature. So absolutely love it. Today what we're going to talk about is digital planning and execution from simple to complex. So Martin and I were kind of talking about, you know, what would a topic be? What would something fun be to go through? And so I decided to kind of go this route with it. And the way that we're going to go through it today is I'm a wet fingered guy. So it's going to be all instead of topic based, it's all patient based and we're going to go really deep in on some of the topics with the patients and and see really how these concepts work what are the principles behind everything and kind of go from there and any questions you guys have as we go through this feel free to stop me let's discuss stuff if it's not in the eight gajillion slides which i put you know together for this it will be in the billion other slides which i have and we can pull that up too okay because the bottom line is is it's just making sure you get out of today what would be helpful for you and your practice so when you go back Monday, you can apply whatever it is that, that we're talking about. So how I've kind of set this up is the following way. I've taken three big concepts, okay, that all have, in all these cases, have challenges and all the cases have flaws. And I've deliberately done that because I, you, hopefully some of this work is pretty, but the reality is we all have problems every day. And sometimes from the podium, I don't know how else, how else to say this, but you see dental porn, you know, and just beautiful <laughs> stuff with like no substance. I'm going to show you ways that I've screwed up cases and we can hopefully get our, you know, and show you the ways that I solved them to some extent and different things like that. So I've been quite deliberate with how I've chosen these cases because I think we all learn so much more from the issues that we have then just showing a perfect case that went awesome every single time, okay? And so with this, we're gonna look, like I say, we're gonna do more than these three because we kind of expanded out the time a little bit and I brought in some other ones and different things like that. But we're gonna start off with kind of a more simple case like this, although this could be an extremely tough one, right? The two single central incisors. Who wants to make your practice just of that? Right? Nobody, it's brutal. So we're gonna start off with the simpler type ones like this. Then we're going to go to the more complex ones. We're going to go through edentialism somewhat here. Uh, Martin and I had talked, you know, he wanted me to spend a little bit of time on some digital dentures, so I'm going to show you some stuff that way because, I mean, at our university, we're doing about 20 to 30 arches of digital dentures a week, a ton of them. And I haven't done a conventional denture. Me personally, I haven't done a conventional denture in probably five or six years because I helped Iva Clark develop their, their system. And we haven't done one in the university since January. Not a single set of carded teeth, not anything like that. So we're going to go through some of that, then get into how we plan these bigger cases, whether it's from a hybrid perspective or whether it's from an overdenture perspective, and we'll look at some nuances of each of those. Then we're going to look at something a little more complex, okay? These full arch cases, we're going to look at some of the full arch restorative workflows that we can do. Um, how some of the software and stuff that we've developed on the prime scan really can kind of help us in these. And what we want when we're going through these is we want predictability, whether it's in the final restorative work like we have here, whether it's in the provisional work like we see there. We want predictability and we want principles that make it so that it can be predictable every darn time we do it. Because these same, type, these same types of cases that we do 
we can have wildly different results in different problems like we see here, okay? That single central can end up a whole lot suckier than you anticipated, okay? Your provisional that you thought was so awesome maybe wasn't so awesome at all, okay? This poor lady was walking around like this for eight years. And it was brutal. She'd been to a million prosthodonta. She finally came to me. Again, they didn't make parts for her implants anymore. I actually had to hand cut parts and jimmy rig them from other parts, but finally got her something. And your restorative work, while it was awesome, the patient comes back and is like, dude, I think something's wrong. And you look in there and you go, no, it looks great. He's like, no, it's something here. And then this opens up like a sweet barn door. He's like, check it out. You can open it up, snap it shut, open it, snap it shut. He's doing it with his tongue. I'm like, that's the coolest thing ever. I got to get a picture of this. <laughs> and we get a picture of it. But it can be a little bit difficult, okay, some of these things. And so that's why as we go through this, we're going to really look at what concepts and what the data is relative to some of these things to really help simplify our lives. Now with this, kind of the overarching concepts that are not on this screen are for the singles, we're going to look at just planning from what's called the 3-2 rule. I'm a big fan of this. This is from Lyndon Cooper. I honestly should have it like tattooed on my stomach upside down so I can look at it every day because I use it all the time. But we're going to look at what the 3-2 rule is and how that can apply. For planning our larger cases, our full arch cases, we're going to use what I like to call the three A's. This was just a random protocol, which I came up with. And then on the restorative work for the full arch, which is where, when we'll talk about scan pattern and stuff like that that we talked about earlier in the conference, is we'll get into some of that. And it's funny because how that came about is we started doing you know, research on scan pattern in about 2016 or 2017, and we'd call the companies and we're like, dude, how, like, what's the proper scan pattern? And most of them, there was literally only one company that said, well, you do this. But most of them were like, what do you mean? You just get your scanner, you kind of go like this, and boom, you have a model. And we're like, dude, it doesn't work that way. Like, these are built from math. And they're like, well, you just stick it in there and rub it around. And we're like, no, you don't. So that's how, like, all of our research projects have kind of come about from things that we've seen clinically and problems we've run into clinically. And so that's how that scan pattern one came about is because nobody knew and then we started kind of figuring it out and went, holy crap, it really makes a big difference on how you scan, how that plays into the accuracy. So we're gonna go through all of this stuff. So let's first start off with our more simple case here, our three, two rule case, and we'll go through all the kind of nuances with, these, with this case, okay? So this is her presentation, okay? Great presentation. She, <laughs> how I got to see her, is the dean of our dental school, okay, my boss, says, hey, this is one of my best friends and my neighbor. And she's a, and again, the dean's a periodontist. Says, this is my best friend and my neighbor. She needs two implants on the centrals. I'm not doing them, you're doing them. Because <laughs> she's like, I gotta see this lady every day. Like, she's my friend, I don't wanna jack this up. Whoop. And so I say, okay, no pressure there at all. And so she comes in like this, and I'm kind of looking at her going, okay, no problem. And the dean sends over, you know, a disc with the CBCT, and I put that in, and I start looking at it because I'm going, why in the world are we treating her? And again, when we look at the CBCT from the two different cross-sectional views, you begin to start to see why we're treating her. Massive, massive resorption that's gone on. It's blown all the way out, start, is starting to blow out the bone. And so I say, okay, I get it now. And it's interesting, when you look at the data on this, I don't know about you guys, but I'm seeing a lot, lot, lot more resorption, at least that's what we're seeing in the US, is like, I see it every freaking day, it seems like now. And I don't think it's just CBCT. Because of CBCT, we're seeing it more. It just seems like it's coming up more. And if you look at the data, the only real paper that there is on this from a systematic review point of view was from 2006, and it says, you know, Internal resorption incidence is between 0.01% to 55%. <laughs> like, we could, I could have written that paper on the plane on the way over here, because it's like, I don't know, it's anywhere between basically not there and half of the people have it. High five. Like, how that got through the reviewers, I don't know. But again, this is where we are data perspective relative to these things. 
okay? So that's why she's coming in is because she's got these resorptive lesions. They're blowing the tooth out and are going from there. Now, it doesn't matter if we're going digital, analog, whatever we're doing, principles are the things that matter, okay? The tools are just the tools, okay? So we've got to start out with some of the fundamental things relative to her. So if she's coming into your practice on Monday, there are some very good things that her case has going for her, okay? And when we look at our kind of just go through your mental checklist right now of what's great and what sucks on her, because we're gonna go through this. So when we look at the good, what we see is this. Again, she's got a nice occlusal plane. She's got big, long, broad contacts. That's gonna really help out with papilla, okay? From there, look at that biotype. I mean, that's thick, luscious tissue right there. Like, I'm happy with that. The papillas are present everywhere on this. And then one of the great things is she's been walking around with these two crowns forever. Okay, and you're looking at that going, okay, they're way off. We can do better here. So I'm going, all right, it's got some great things going for her. Now, what are the bad things that she has for her? Because we've got to kind of look at each of these steps as we go through. When we look at the bad things, again, first things first that my brain looks at with this is I say, okay, it doesn't look quite right through here. And it's partially due to the asymmetric nature of these two lateral incisors. And she's got this huge incisal embrasure. And it doesn't matter how perfect you make that, those two centrals, it's always going to look a little bit off because of that incisal embrasure. And so that's one of the things we kind of talk to her about, say, okay, this, you know, we can do a veneer, we can do some little bonding, we can do whatever we want. She's fine with it, and I'm fine with it as well, but it's just the type of thing where we make sure that she's aware of that. When you look at it, the upper and lower midlines are off. I don't bring that up to her. Okay, I've got it on the photo. I remember one time I was taking, my assistant had like a single veneer. Her, you know, her dad's a dentist, her brother's a dentist, her mom's a hygienist. You know, she's been in dentistry her whole life. And I'm taking some pictures because she wants the single veneer replaced. And she's looking at it, and I said, you know, Mary, have you ever noticed your midline's off? And she's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> so she gets the mirror, puts the mirror like this close to her face, like every good patient. And she's like, what? It's off. And I'm like, yeah. And it ruined her life for like a month and a half. <laughs> okay, like she was just obsessed with it. So I usually don't say, hey, yeah, guess what? Your midlines are off. And especially not on this one, because if you look at the size of the teeth, there's a size discrepancy between the two centrals, okay? And if we make the left one the proper size, it's gonna shift the midlines off even more, okay? Other things, gingival heights are off, okay, they're a little bit off between the two. And then kind of the final thing is here, I said this was a good thing, but you look at it, and you look at the shade, and you said, well, why, why'd you have it on the good and the bad? Because if you look at it from the bad perspective, this is what you see when you start to really blow it up, and again, it's not really doing it, it justice on this, but the closest thing I can find is a D2 shade tab, and she has 8,000 colors in there. And it was no wonder that the previous clinician in the previous lab was like, straight up D2. Let's move in that direction, because this is gonna be wicked hard to go ahead and try to match, okay? So we've got all that stuff going on. The other bad thing from her, well, I guess I shouldn't say bad thing, we'll say challenging thing, that would be the better, more political, correct way to say it, is her smile, okay? This is her posed smile. And when we look at the smile line of patients, and we start really looking at this, again, the data is from 1984 from Ton's paper, and what it shows is you've got a low, medium, and high. Okay, low is showing 75% of the tooth, medium is showing 100% of the tooth, high is anywhere above that. And back in the 80s, obviously people didn't smile apparently, because about 90% of the patients only showed the teeth and nothing more. But you fast forward about 20 years, and what you see is this. If you look at Leibert's paper, they actually went and changed it and started adding more to the high smile line because what they had is they added a very high, which is a class one, and a high, which is a class two. And the very high was two to four millimeters of gum show exposure, you know, then the high was from zero to two. And you take that into account because when you look at this photo and you've got your sweet DSLR camera, you're right in front of the patient, and you're saying, smile and click in that photo, how reliable do you think that photo is? Is that their true smile most of the time? It's not even close. You're like, smile, and they kind of go. And you're like, dude, come on, that's not you. You're trying to coax them, you're trying to get them to laugh, which is harder, you know, in the COVID times where we had like 40 masks on and plastic sheets in front of us. But it's not a very reliable photo. And when you look at this wonderful paper by Mon, what it actually shows is this. 
they had a video camera going and then they had their camera going were snapping pictures and with the video camera which is the spontaneous what they saw is if you look at class one and class two remember these are the two that are actually showing gums those two right there in posed again guys didn't show any two to four millimeters and guess what they actually did 16 percent women went from eight to 36 percent and when you add these numbers up these are the amount of patients percentage that actually displayed the gingiva was 81 percent when it was spontaneous and thus what that means is if you just took that posed photo and it wasn't real smile there was a 44 percent chance that you got it wrong okay and this is especially important when we're talking at full arch because if you thought they had a low smile line and then they get to laughing and that thing goes nine feet up into their head <laughs> and you thought, oh, I'm going to do an FP2 and I don't have to reduce much and all of a sudden they smile and they've got a seam running through there, you're dead. Because the only way to fix that is to either not go fixed anymore and go removable where you can put the flange or you trefine back out everything you just did and start over. So it's a bad, bad day. That's why this is extremely important to see right out of the gate. So those are the diagnostics. Now let's get to using our tools, okay? When we look at our diagnostics, again, every single solitary patient that comes in gets scanned, okay? Doesn't matter if they've got teeth, no teeth, whatever, they're getting a scan. That's just part of my entry form for patients. So we've got the patient, we've got her scanned, we've got her diagnostics, and we're looking at her. And I mean, one of the greatest things ever for this patient in particular is this is her bite, okay? She's biting harder over here. She's biting nothing through here, she, okay? You could pass a Slim Jim through there, okay? Lots of space, because I'm gonna try to immediately load this. This is what I'm going for. I'm thinking perfect from an occlusal perspective. We saw earlier, I can't remember who was saying it, you know, a couple of the speakers were like, I'd like to take it out of occlusion. Well, perfect. This is always out of occlusion. It's wonderful. So we've got that going for us. So in every software we want, these are the different types of things that we want to have bare minimum in any implant planning software that you use, okay? You want what are going to be the idealized teeth. She likes her teeth, so I'm using the pre-ops as my kind of guide. If the teeth aren't great or she's missing them, go ahead and wax it up. You take a CBCT. Again, with the CBCT, I always say, you know, have the CBCT from a dentate patient slightly open, whether that's using the little bite stick or whether you're putting some cotton rolls back here in case they don't have front teeth. Just have the patient a little bit open because what we need to do with all of these is go ahead and merge everything together and it really helps to have those teeth slightly open. Now the final thing on her is we're going to do a virtual extraction. We actually saw that in one of the cases. One thing that I would say with these is there's lots of different ways to do it. There's normal software, there's mesh mixer, which is what this upper one is. The bottom line with all of it, and what I want to make sure we notice here, is if you look at these two teeth, okay, I've left just a teensy tiny hint of the teeth there. Because the last thing when you do a virtual extraction is if you overcut the tooth, what's going to happen when you go to put your guide on? It's going to go clink and hit the teeth and not seat. And sometimes we're kind of shy on things and so then you've got to go in and start grinding on it and you're grinding on it now hitting the sleeve. So I always, when I take the teeth off, I make sure I just leave it a little tiny, tiny bit there. And then when I build my provisionals off this, I bulk it out just a little bit extra, okay? But for where my guide's going to sit on, which is what this is right here, I always make sure I just have this little tiny thing. And it was so much easier back in the day where we used to cut it off with models. It's a little bit harder to digitally cut teeth off and get them absolutely super precise, at least in my, my opinion. But that's why I always err a little bit on leaving just a teeny tiny sliver there, okay? Now, from a planning perspective, again, you can either plan it yourself. I'm a huge Simplant guy. I mean, that's like, you'd have to pry that from my cold, dead hands because I use it so frequently. You can either plan it that way or you can send it to DS, have them do the Azento type pathway and go that way. There is no right or wrong here. It's whatever is best for the workflow in your own particular practice. Bottom line though, is it doesn't matter if you're planning it or they're planning it. There are some principles which you need to know, and these are kind of the important things to be able to check and make sure that the engineers, if they are planning it for you, are planning it correctly. So what are the things which we need to know? As far as the si single implants here in the anterior, again, the thing which I like to use to help me plan these things is the three-tool rule, 
okay? And what this is, is this is a prosthetically driven rule where you take the idealized teeth which you have and you break it into two very important component parts because these two parts are going to help you plan any case whatsoever. The first is the CEJ and the second is the incisal edge. Once you know where that ideal position of both of those things are, it's game over because you can easily plan everything relative to that. And if you look at the 3-2 rule, what you do is you take the CEJ, you go three millimeters up, two millimeters in, that's where we're going to plan the implant. Then the incisal edge portion is used for you to go ahead and tweak the angulation relative to the incisal edge. That way, if you want it cement retained, you're going to move that angulation back so it gets behind that incisal edge. Okay? So that's how the 3-2 rule is used. See, Michael, I should photobomb one of these again, right? <laughs> we were laughing because I did that to one of his photos like two weeks ago, and it's an awesome, awesome thing. But anyway, that's what you do for the 3-2 rule. Now, why? Because that's the bottom line is I can tell you whatever, but there's got to be a rationale as to why we're doing these things, okay? When you look at the data, and again, I won't have time to go through all of this, but I think this is kind of, these are the most important papers right here. If you look at Chen, she's got two papers, and it's Buckle has got one, kassen has got one. But what they saw in these papers is they were looking for anything that caused interproximal or facial recession, okay? And the thing that consistently and significantly did was the implant placed too far facially. And when you looked at the incidence rates of those papers, Basically, if you don't have that two millimeters back or so, then what you have is you have between an 11% and a 50% chance of getting facial recession, okay? That's why it's important to be able to know where that CEJ is and back off that implant, those two millimeters. So we go ahead and do these things, plan it, go up three, two on these, plan the implants, and then you start looking at how these are coming through because we're pretty thin on the bone and I'm coming right through the front because that's where bony housing is, okay? Now, with it coming through the front like this, this is when I'm going to use the angled screw access, okay? We talked about this a little bit, the hexilobular screw that we have, okay? Now, with it, again, I'm gonna do these immediate. I wanna have my custom abutment parts made. I'm gonna make some pre-op provisionals, all these, so I order my surgical guide. I go to Atlantis. I upload the, that to Atlantis, go ahead and order my abutments, and again, my, where I tell Atlantis, I say, look, here's my CEJs, I want all my abutments one millimeter deep from where my CEJs are. They say, okay, and this is my first proposal, and I go, that's not actually at all what I wanted. So I go back and say, no, remember I said one millimeter deeper? They said, okay, no problem. Boom, it's deeper. I'm like, okay, that looks pretty good, but let's go ahead and make them a little bit wider. So now it will support everything. And finally on round three, I got my abutments where I want them. And the great thing about Simplan is we can take these, these files and put them back in the software so you can see where everything's sitting relative to the bone and relative to the soft tissue and everything else on your scans so that you can make sure the abutments are where they need to be. At that point, I like that third version. I say, go ahead and build these. I order what's called the core file, which some of you have probably used before. And again, I get back these things called core files. And what they do is they send these four different things, and we'll look at them from a full arch perspective a little bit later. But these are the different things which we have from a core file, okay? They've got my idealized teeth. They've got the abutments virtually placed like they're there. They've got my cup model, and then they've got these two of the actual abutments there. And what we usually use is we just use these two and we usually throw everything else away. Because we're like, okay, this helps me know where my teeth are. This is what I'll build off of. I'll chuck the rest of those. But the reality is if you use this type of workflow, hold on to this file because we'll actually use it for the finals later on. And I'll show you how we go about using that. Because if we've got something like this, we don't need to pop out this sweet piece that you built there and put a scan body in. You've got all the information here, and I'll show you how to kind of use that and correlate it all together. Now, does this workflow actually work? See, it's too bad. There's sweet, grayed out teeth all right here. If you squint, you can probably not see them. <laughs> but there they are, they're over there. <laughs> but when we look at this workflow of using these core files, this is a wonderful paper by Stephanie Zeller. This is part of her thesis. And what she looked at was she looked at 
This core file one is this Atlantis fully digital, where we build the abutments virtually, then we design crowns on them virtually, okay? Atlantis interrupted is you actually make the, the abutment, you put it on a model, you rescan it and go from there. Then we've got a split file from 3Shape. And what you see when you look at all of this is, again, the thing that has the smallest marginal gap, which is what we're looking for, is actually this completely virtual pathway. So again, we're going to build everything off of that. So I get my, it's fine, you don't need to change it, man. It's like you rob Peter to pay Paul. Like some of the pictures will look great, and then it will blow out the others. And the, I thought you had it wonderful how, how you had it. So I get my abutments. Everything's good. Again, when we look at the angled screw axis, the whole point of angled screw axis is because, again, our hex tool is going to have to go in there, and I don't really love it coming through the facial or through the incisal edge, so that's when we're going to use this, which, again, you can change this up to, as we talked about, just about 30 degrees. And how it works, the one little caution you have to have with these things is the greater the angle correction you have, the bigger the axis has to be, okay? So keep that, mind, keep that in mind because what the screw actually has to do is the screw's got to go in and then make that turn to be able to go down and seat, okay? So again, if it's got a big angle change, it's got to make the cutout out of the center is going to be significantly bigger because it's got to make that turn. So keep that in mind. Some of the other kind of design principles you have to keep in mind with these and with other screw retained restorations just in general are the following. You want at least one millimeter of restorative material from that hole to your incisal edge. You don't want any material around the hole because that can fracture, okay? And the final thing is, it, again, if this is possible, this is from Dew's paper, you want to keep that hole between one and three millimeters. They saw an increased fracture possibility when it went up to the four millimeter, okay? So try to keep that hole kind of as small as possible. So I get my core file. I'm going to use these principles to then design my provisionals. And literally, I put it in lab, and I just hit forward, 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 and this was my first proposal. Like, it kind of crushed it right out of the gate, which is pretty great. And on this particular case, I decided to use multiple softwares, multiple mills, which you'll see here in a second. So I design it one way, again, like this in, in lab. And then I designed it in one of the other softwares that I use, which is what I use all day and day out. And I got these awesome proposals, which look like spears, which are cool if you want to give your patient spears for teeth, but not anywhere near what we want. And the reality is sometimes software, software is awesome. I, I would be dead without software, but sometimes it can screw you over a little bit. And so with this, in order to get it to work, it just didn't matter what I did to it, I could not get great proposals. So I just had to re-import the case, you know, run it through this thing called Model Builder, and by that time I was able to go ahead and, and do some nice things with it. The great thing about digital design, though, is, you know, with just the matter of a change of a button, you can change up the molds. And that's what we do with our patients is, you know, if I'm doing a full mouth or something like that, or a full mouth wax up, I will design everything on the computer and I just send the patient screenshots of it. That way they can approve it that way and I don't have to fully print it out and, and go that route. So we get it where we want. I'm liking the designs. I'm going to go ahead and, and mill out my teeth. And so I'm going to use three different mills. This is the first one and you can see it's all right. It looks kind of cool, but we can see we're a little bit shy. We go to mill number two. Sounds like a game show, right? Mill number two. <laughs> and you get this awesomeness. I mean, a little resin cement down there and we're good, right? You just <laughs> put a buttload of cement, just kind of go there with a scaler or a plastic instrument, you're good. Not even close. And when you look at it from the side, you're going, what the heck? And you have the tendency to say, stupid machine. My machine sucks. What happened with this? And the reality is, most of the time, it's not the machine. It's us. It's a machine. And what it has to do, when you have problems like this, it generally is an issue with parameters. And every machine and every material have different parameters, and you've just got to dial in the machines. And again, if you ever have a problem like this, go through and start tweaking some of your, your different parameters to get it there. Third machine, again, printed out, or printed out, milled out just fine. 
And so now we're ready to go. Now I've got to put the finishing touches on the teeth. And this is when we're going to look at texture, because I think we saw, in, again, in that, I think it was the last lecture where, where you really mapped out the shade wonderfully. And I think we're, we do a great job of that as far as dentists go. We're really good at saying, okay, this is A1 here. We've got a little blue right here. They've got gray right here. But one of the things we miss is texture frequently. And from a texture perspective, if you look at her teeth, again, she's got some vertical, some horizontal movements in there. And when you look at what teeth actually have, this is from a Zhang paper from 2010, which I love it because it's the ultimate nerd paper. And what it shows on it is this. If you look at central incisors, 94% of them had vertical grooves, okay? From a horizontal groove, 77% of them had horizontal. 31% had one, 35 two, 11% had three. And this paper went even further of what it did is it looked at the eight most common types of texture that you can see in teeth. Again, the most common one was this one here. Two vertical, two horizontal. Then it goes less, 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 less. And what do you think was the absolute least thing that you saw in nature? Nothing. Okay, but how often do the rest restorations we make, our provisionals, et cetera, look like that? Okay, all the time. Okay, and so I think this is one area where we've got to put a little bit more emphasis on is not only looking at the shade, but looking at about what textures are in there because that way we can really dial in our restorative work even all that much further. Okay, but when we look at the texture, I go ahead and mill them out, and again, it's pretty flat, and then I go ahead and start putting on the texture with a burr, okay, to get that set. And then at this point, I have all the things ready that I need to be able to go to surgery, okay? I've got my surgical guide, I've got my provisionals, I've got my abutments, and again, these are kind of screw mentimal provisionals with, with holes on the lingual to make it screw retained, okay? So, let's go to surgery and start seeing some of the other areas where I've screwed up. She shows up like this, life starts getting pretty good. Take out the one tooth, no problem right there. Start taking out the other tooth, snaps. That never happens to anyone in this room, I'm sure. I'm saying some bad words in my brain at this point. Dig it out, finally get it out. And again, I, I do the same thing as you. I curette and curette and curette and curette. Get these things as clean as I possibly can. I almost spend more time curetting than it, I do getting the teeth out because I want it as clean as humanly possible. Now we're ready to go. So everything's set, my guide goes on. Again, biggest thing with the guide is making sure it fits. You all have probably used the guided system before, so we go ahead, start drilling right in. Again, we've got our sleeve, we've got our, our drill, just drill to depth, it goes right in. The driver, again, we know it's the, the notch that we're trying to line up. Spin that thing down so that it goes all the way down and the two areas line up. And again, this is, I mean, we, when we were first testing this and, and kind of developing this concept was like 2012 or 13. And I remember the first case and I was just amazed it worked. You know, I'm like, geez, we can plan an implant. We can actually time it. Because how we used to have to do it is I, I would have to get like a guide. I'd have to put a driver on it with an analog and retro pour the model and build everything that way to be able to get pre-made parts and it was such a pain in the butt and I remember the first you know doing basically first one of these and again lining everything up and going holy crud you know as long as you line up the depth to the best of your ability and that notch everything else fits and that's exactly what happened I put these on I finger tightened them in just to make sure things were fitting well at that point basically I grabbed the provisionals, I put them on, I took them back off, and guess what happened when I went to torque them? The one goes, eep. And then I start saying some real bad words in my brain because I don't, if you noticed on those plans, it was pretty thin there. I don't have a lot of wiggle room. And again, on the one, this one, I was probably about, you know, 23, 24, and again, I've got to put the abutments in. This one was, you know, I hit probably 19, 20, and it started to move on me. So I went, ah, crap. This is the dean's best friend. Her neighbor has a smile line up to her forehead. I'm going conservative on here. The problem with going conservative is I didn't have any backup if they didn't torque. 
because I'm used to things torquey. So I went, ah, crap. So I put cover screws on, bone grafted the lip of the snot out of her, closed her up, said, I will see you tomorrow with a great Essex for you. <laughs> she says, okay. She's like the sweetest lady known to man. She's like, okay. So go ahead and do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Hills without any, you know, any incident. Start opening up the case. Lots of good tissue and whatnot. Decided to sculpt the gingiva just a little bit with the, uh, with the burr. And again, when you have all these pre-op parts, you're kind of bummed because you're like, man, I just paid all this money. I couldn't load it. This sucks. But guess what? Just put it in a box and then get it back out when you go to uncover it. So that's exactly what I did on her. Just use the same parts, pull them out of the box, retorqued in the abutments, cemented on the provisional crowns, and again, got her set. At that point, I sent her home. We waited about six weeks for the gum tissue to go ahead and, and kind of form. And now it's time to scan. So I go to start scanning this case. And again, all I do is scan first the provisionals. I take the provisionals off and then I start scanning the abutments themselves. Now look at how much fun I had on this scan. Do you guys remember when the software used to do this? I have to do a lot of testing and sometimes what you test is sometimes not fun, but I start scanning the abutments. Life's looking pretty good. I start getting it here. I move on and son of a bee, it cuts it out. Go back to this one. I've got you and it cuts that one out. Go back over here, jump back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Finally got them because it just didn't love stuff that didn't look like teeth. Okay. And again, luckily that's improved and improved and improved over the time, but it was a brutal scan at that time. But get everything. I've got my provisionals. I have my scan of my abutments. I haven't taken them out because I don't want to take them out. And what you have to do here is you just need enough of those abutments to capture the shape. You don't need a packed cord to be able to expose the margin. You don't need to do anything like that. Because the reality is you have this, these lovely files already. And they've got all your marginal information on there. And so what you have to do is get this scan, then just merge that and that with that. Okay? That way, when we get it into our laboratory software, we've got all of our marginal information right there. Okay? Mark, yeah. then you don't really need the tips of the abutment because you can align them on the margins, right? Yeah, but that's if you can expose the margins. If these are down underneath, you need the tips. Oh. Okay? And that's one thing which we've talked about from the Atlanta side is on this type of workflow, because when like a Zento was released and stuff, you know, question number one is we're like, dude, how uh, how are we going to do the restorative? And they're like, well, you just take out the abutment and put on a scan body. And I'm like, why the crap would I want to do that? I just bought an abutment. And so we've, even now, we're still working on this to where we may be putting some fiduciary markers on those abutments so it just merges really, really easy. Yeah? When you have the initial one where you have the abutment on and it twisted around on talking, I assume you twisted it back I did. before yep. covering up the implant. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so when it moved, I went, fudge. That's the word I said. And then I put back on the guide, I put the driver back in and I moved it back to, to line it back up. Yeah, otherwise it wouldn't fit. There's been a couple other cases where, you know, I'm right at, you know, Torx 25 on Astra. And so like at like 24, it goes, and there have been a few times, again, oh yeah, you're recording. I probably shouldn't even say this. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I was going to say, like, this doesn't leave this room. It, this is peers, right? You can do whatever. So, but where it has twisted, then I've gone in, ahead and just grab, you know, I'll go grab a rongier because I always have a rongier on like every kit I have. I just grab a rongier, grab the, uh, grab the whole thing and just turn it back to where it was and slide the provisional over. But yeah, that's, that's the thing. When, it, when they move, you got to put the guide back on and move them back to where, <coughs> excuse me, they line up and then go from there. Because yeah, if not, everything's gonna be twisted. So, but again, you just have to capture enough of the abutment so that you can merge it back, okay? And that's exactly what we did here to be able to design the crowns. Design the crowns on these things. Again, this was from my lab tech, Jack Murano. Jack does a wonderful job. He made these beautiful pieces of art. He's stoked, I'm stoked. Because like when you're, you know, and you can probably speak to this, everybody that presents, like when you have one of these podium cases, and you've seen I've already screwed up a bunch of stuff on it, but when you have these podium cases, you're like, oh, heck yeah. 
this is gonna be freaking awesome. Like my lab guy's stoked, I'm stoked, we're like high-fiving. He sends me these wonderful pieces of art. I go ahead and put them in. We've got the bright light on her. This is what it looks like with my flash going off. Bright lights on her, like I'm high-fiving my assistant. We're like, oh heck yeah, we crushed this. You know, Jack did awesome, high-five. And then the, <laughs> the patient's like, can I see? I'm like, sure. <laughs> So she gets the mirror, she puts the mirror in front of her face, which blocks the bright light. And it was the biggest case of metamorism I've ever had in my entire life. It looked like the second the bright light was off, it looked like these teeth needed endo. And she's just such a sweet lady. She's like, well, I like the provisionals better, um, but whatever you think. And I'm like, what the heck just happened? So I like grabbed her arm and I moved it out of the way and all of a sudden the bright light hits it. It looks like this. I moved her hand back in front of the bright light. It looked dead. And so now I'm starting to panic, right? I'm like, holy crap, how am I going to fix this? So like every <laughs> idiot, I'm like, let's take you outside and look at them in natural light. Because <laughs> magically she's going to walk around the earth right underneath the sun for her whole life. So we go outside, like they look still kind of dead, you know, and I'm like, oh, freak. So I said, okay, look, these look like crap. Let me get my cameras and take some pictures to be able to show the lab. So I take my pictures. We've got four different cameras, including my crappy iPhone, and they all look freaking good because of the bright light. And so I'm going, how in the world am I going to convey this to Jack to fix this. You know, and a lot of times you can take these pictures, you can black and white them, and then you can see the value differences. Black and white them, they still look good. I'm going, ah, crap. So, do this, and finally I had the idea. I was like, you know what? When the bright light's off, you can tell. So I got the idea, I, I just FaceTimed my lab guy. I said, Jack, check this out. Had the light off, and in FaceTime, with no light on there, he could actually see. He's like, oh crap, those look totally wrong. And I'm like, yeah, they do. And again, it was no one's fault. It was just a problem of, of the different opacities and stuff. So we went back, <coughs> excuse me, just knocked this off. I did just knock this off. There we go. So go back, and again, also shade mapped it out. Shade map was exactly what we, what we saw. And so we did the triple mulligan, and this is the great thing about digital is we went and just milled out three different ones with different opacities, okay, different opacities of Zerk. And Jack finished two of them and he left one for me to do. So he's like, dude, if these two don't work, you go ahead and custom stain and glaze. And I said, no problem. So luckily this set right over here was the one that finally worked. And again, we got a nice result from it. Here she is with her, with her smile. And again, that's her kind of laughing, and you can see how far up it goes. And I mean, it goes woo, way up here when she really smiles. And this is where she was at, at 18 months, right as I, I left. But again, we were able to do this nice kind of progression of the case just due to following correct principles. But again, ran into some problems. Ran into stability problems, ran into color problems, ran into design problems and milling problems. These are all things we run into. Okay, so that's the simplest case. Any questions at all with that? Yeah. Mark, can I ask if you can import that core file into just into the normal prime scan to design in-house? Um, man, I'll be honest. I, I do it all on, on the lab software. So I, I'll, I'll be frank, I don't know. Because that's, I, I do all mine on lab software. I mean, that's the nerdy thing about me is like I live and die in the lab side of things just because of, uh, I, I generally do, pretty big cases and it's, it's much easier to do it on the lab site. So I'm not sure. I, I know you can because we, we developed that workflow back in, a, I think it was 2017, where you could bring it straight directly in and then you can design the core file in it. I just haven't done it since we tested it because I just bring everything into my lab software, to be honest. Yeah. Is that in Lab 32? Is that in Lab 32 software? Uh, it can be any, any laboratory software. Yeah, so I've got 21 currently. I've got 3Shape and ExoCAD, like I've got, I, I test a lot of stuff as Martin was kind of talking about, like I, I 
test like every scanner out there. We test all the software. We develop stuff for a lot of people. And you can do it in, in, in Lab 22. You can do it in any of the, the softwares that, that you'd like. Um, if you're going to bring in that, that single core file, just the tooth part, that part does have to be done in lab software, unfortunately. So you can bring in the, the core file with it, with the abutment stuck you know, on the cut model. You can bring that in without any problem. But if you're wanting to merge your scan with that single file, that does need to be done in lab software currently. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. I've been caught out with the shade thing in the past as well. What did the technician do differently? We just changed opacities. So the opacity was pretty, uh, we used a pretty um, kind of translucent zerk on the first one, and we used much more opaque zerks on the subsequent one. So we used two different opacities, and we changed the shade on, on the middle one just in case we were off to increase the, the value. Was it the Yitria comp? It was. Yep. Yeah. So can I just ask what method do you use for taking a shade? How do you do it? How do you relay the shade information to the technician? Usually what I do is I map it all out kind of similar to, I think it was your picture, where like I draw it all out. I'm like, it's funny, I don't remember who this morning put up the lab script that just said like, you know, crown 14, A3 or whatever. Like a lot of the times that's how my, you know, my things are except in these type cases then I draw the living snot out of every last thing. I have one drawing on shade, then one drawing on texture, and I send that to, to my lab. So he's got all that different stuff there. But yeah, I, I just put different shade tabs. Again, we took the digital one just to verify what we had seen, what I'd seen clinically, and it, it, it actually lined up pretty much the same, which is kind of weird, because I just haven't had very good success with those digital shade matching you know, parts of scanners, to be honest. So. Yeah. Surgical question. Uh, you managed to maintain the bone profile very, very exceptionally well. What did you use to adapt to uh, that? Was, that was an allograft. I, can't, I don't remember if it was DMBA or which one it was, like what, what allograft it was, um, to be honest. A lot of times, <laughs> s this is going to sound terrible to everybody, but sometimes I just use whatever my assistant puts out in front of me. Because in, in a university, like, we sometimes don't have all the stuff that I would love to be able to get. You know what I mean? It was funny. My first graft, oh, this was so weird. So my first graft when I moved to the University of Utah, which was about eight months ago, this was, were the providers for the pro basketball team there. Okay, so not small dudes, right? And so I'm taking out canine and a lateral on this guy. So it's going to be huge. Okay, I mean, just monster hole. He had this big infection out of one of them. The other one was just sheared off and shot. I think he got an elbow to the face. And uh, so I was taking things out, grafting them, because of how big this infection was on the other tooth. And they had a... Uh, they had two things of Gem 21 sitting out for me, and I'm like, holy crap, this is going to be like the $4,000 graft, and it's only going to fill up about a quarter of, of the hole that I have there. So I had to go find other graft material. But again, I, I do remember it was an allograft. I don't remember exactly which, which one it was. Well, okay, so my thesis. I, my thesis when I finished PROS was, do we graph the gap or not? Okay, Because if you look at Arujo's work and a bunch of different work, it says, do graft, and it usually says, do graft it with a xenograft, and that causes, that mitigates the plate from, from moving. My thesis, I, you know, and we did this in conjunction with profile implants, but my thesis was looking at, do we graft or don't graft it? We did like 40 profiles, half grafted, half didn't graft. This was the original, you know, TX profile. And um, my thesis showed that it, it really didn't matter, to be honest. That being said, I think my thesis was underpowered. I think once we got higher ends that, you, that really it did matter to graft the gap. But again, the, the research tends to show that grafting that gap does matter. Xenograft does work pretty darn well for that. For this particular one, I used, used an allograft. 
question. Do you think that using your final button right from the onset helps? I, I, I personally think it does. If, if you look at the data relative to kind of one abutment one time, um, there's about five different papers out there. Again, I don't have it on this, this particular lecture, but there's about five different papers out there that actually do show that it is, by taking it on and off, it significantly, you, you do get more bone loss, okay? Now, it's only to the tune of the most positive paper shows like 0.18 millimeters of bone loss. The least positive shows about a half millimeter. So does it make a real big difference clinically? Maybe, but I, I feel that it can. And, and again, I, I'd rather not take something off and disturb the system that's, that's being developed there. Now, one thing when you do this is, again, you still have to put something in the hole you can't put the abutment and try to pack that facial gap through the abutment. I usually put a cover screw, you know, pack the whole facial there, unscrew the cover screw, then put my custom abutment on because I've tried to put my custom abutment on and like pack around it and you're just boxed out by your custom abutment. So, but I do think it does. Mark, yeah. just to comment to all of that, I think one of the greatest uh, misplaced ideologies about grafting the gap is that it's all about gap distance. I, I'm trying to remember who the article was, but I think the reality is, is it's much more about the thickness of the button plate. Yeah. And I think if you've got a button plate that's greater than half a millimetre thick, it doesn't really matter how big the gap is. But in this case, I noticed you've got very prominent roots, yep. very, very thin button plate, and you absolutely have to graph that gap. Oh, 100%. So I think it's much more about the thickness of the button plate than it is the, the, the width of the gap. Yeah, I mean, the jump, so again, that goes back to jumping distance. And part of the problem with jumping, we're getting way off the rails here, but part of the problem with jumping distance is what our original thought with jumping distance was, was it came from a rabbit study where they saw that when they drilled into the, the rabbit, the rabbit's bone couldn't jump 0.7 millimeters. And so that's where the concept was, oh, we've got to put the implant absolutely intimate with the socket and ended up putting in really big implants. And the problem with that is the bone in humans will resorb. And if you look at Schropp's paper, Schropp's paper from, I think it was 2000, ugh, 2007, 2008, something like that. I mean, it can show up to a five to seven millimeter jumping distance occurred about 70% of the time. Okay, you could get it to come back. Yeah, just to expand on that. Uh, just some guidance for it over here. The majority of anterior teeth have very thin buckle plates. Yeah, it's point six millimeters. Less than point eight. Yeah. And as you go around in the, <coughs> the premolar segment, and it becomes thicker and thicker. So when you're doing the meat of the premolar, you're less likely to cross that. Yeah. Even though those gaps are usually. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, the average central is point six, the lateral is point six to point seven, the canine is point seven. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting. All right, any other questions on that? Okay. Let's move on to now edentialism, okay? Gonna spend a, a few minutes talking about digital dentures, okay? With this lovely, lovely, ready to process, was on the shelf to be processed conventional denture. Does anybody see the problem with this happy dog? Notice that the molars are the wrong side going the wrong direction. So the kid did a wonderful job with this. It had somehow passed quality control and it was sitting there ready to be sent out. We pulled it, we're like, these are backwards. They're like, oh, suck. We didn't notice. <laughs> so yeah, so that was good times. Um, let me just say a couple things about digital dentures because from a time perspective, I'm not gonna go through kind of all the clinical workflows. The reality is whatever you're doing clinically, you can go into the digital workflow because it's from a manufacturing side, from, from dentures, okay? I'm gonna show you some ways that we can do things clinically to kind of speed things up, but if you like the old school, you know, five visit, you know, conventional impression, initial impression, custom tray with final impression, wax rim, that route, you can go that route and hop in the digital workflow kind of whenever it is that you want to, okay? I'll show you some things that can help speed it up, but I, I think digital dentures is a little bit of a misnomer because that's what we all talk about, but it's the digital manufacturing of dentures 
And that's what we're talking about most of the time when we're talking about digital ventures. Now, I'll show you some clinical workflows that we can use all of our digital toys and tools to be able to help us, but just keep that in mind. And I'm gonna kind of do it with two patients, okay? This is the first patient, okay? This is how she's presenting, okay? Class three, hates her teeth. I'm gonna show you how you go from this to your very next visit, having your final denture ready to go, okay? So this is a two visit denture and we're going to use the same principles that we use in the five steps, but I'll show you how we can speed some of these things along, okay? So when we look at kind of the two visits, the reason why she's coming in is because she's got these dentures, they no longer fit, and she doesn't like the teeth, you know, the teeth are worn down, and the interesting thing is she wants much lighter pink for her gums, and I'm like, that's gonna look kind of weird. <laughs> but she's like, my sister has them, and I like how it looks on her. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> so she's coming in with this, and I think what we have in dentistry is we've got this great ability to duplicate step after step after step. Like we like redoing things over and over and over, okay? But what do you have here? If we're looking at the conventional way that we do dentures, what do we have here? The reason she's coming in is because her denture doesn't fit anymore. When we make a custom tray, how do we make a custom tray? You get something that's intimate and then you go ahead and put some wax in there to create some space, right? She's already done this for you, okay? She has made her own custom tray out of her denture, okay? This thing doesn't fit. It already has relief for your material in it, okay? So we've got that, again, from an anatomical standpoint, we're not back to the true anatomy that we want to get here. I put a little bit of wax here, and we went ahead and used <laughs> this denture and took an impression in it, just like it's a custom tray. Now, one note, you're gonna give the denture back to them, please don't put tray adhesive on there unless you want your assistant to spend the next two hours trying to get that back off of the denture. Because we've had students do that, they're like, we painted it. I'm like, did you seriously just paint this thing with adhesive? They're like, yeah. I'm like, you've gotta give the denture back. <laughs> like, they're wearing it in and wearing it back out because this is their denture. So if you, do that, if you do this workflow, don't do that. Just go ahead and, again, I'm extending back the extensions back here and then washing it all you know again did a quick border mold then wash in her own custom tray okay so while she's there sitting there i go ahead and scan this i go ahead and scan her lower arch scan the bite and we've got all those things together right there before the patient leaves okay that's visit clinical visit number one okay and this is what i do with all like every denture patient that comes in i either wash it like this or else I just scan their dentures so I have a reference as to where we're at on day one, okay? So we go ahead and do that. And the reason why you wanna do that is because when you get it to the lab side, we go ahead and put it into the lab side and what you do is you mark kind of where your extensions are and then what the software will do is it will port, virtually port for you, okay? So I've got this master cast right here from it. So we've got, again, your second visit, doing it normal is custom tray. We make our master cast and from here, her denture is also acting as the occlusal rim because we've now got her jaw relationship record where it needs to be, okay? So we've got everything there. The final step is after you go your occlusal rim, the next step that we all know of and love is your aesthetic try-in, right? Go ahead and put the teeth on. Now, what I have to say here is whenever the patient has a denture like this, Think of this as your lab just set up the worst teeth ever for your aesthetic try-in, okay? And you are going to look at this and say, okay, what are all the changes that I need to make to her current denture to be able to get it to ideal? Let's just say they set them terribly like this. What changes would you make to get that ideal? So we kind of look at things, you know, midline's actually on, which is great. Occlusal planes, decent enough. She wants a little bit longer teeth. She wants things changed a little bit. And the, <laughs> the craziest thing with it all is what does she want to be? She wants to be class one. <laughs> Come on. And she's, you know, she's crying, oh, I've always had this underbite, like, drives me nuts. Like, I just want my teeth to come out. Well, when you look at everything on there, Who's gonna do this? Who's 
the crazy one that's going to do this class one. Is anybody in here? You're going, no friggin' way. Okay, your lower jaw's 40 feet out here. Your bone's way back here. Like, we're not going to do it out. And the reason why is because, again, we know class three is going to work. And we're going to build her there because we know it's predictable. But if we wanted to also build her out in class one to try it, what we'd have to do from the conventional perspective is this. We'd have to take basically two impressions, have to take two, make two master casts because that's how you make your dentures, do two wax rims, get four sets of teeth, two anterior sets, two posterior teeth, so we can make both sets of dentures for your tribe, then we'd process them out. And that is a crap ton of work to do, okay? Just to see if something will work. Now, if you look at digital dentures from both a clinical and a laboratory perspective, again, this Perez paper was a systematic review, the Spherison paper was a blinded study. What they saw was digital dentures from the clinical and laboratory side took about four hours total versus 10.5 for conventional. Significantly, significantly faster. And again, I'm gonna make her a class one because I want to, because I want to see if it'll work. So what I do with her is first I make her the one I know is gonna work. So I go ahead and design the teeth. I design her in class three, get it kind of idealized. I save my design. I get my files out of there, send those over to my printer. Then I duplicate the design and I then go and grab the teeth and say, okay, I'm now gonna make you class one. So I just grab all the teeth, and again, I'm kind of changing the opacity a little bit here, and I'm just dragging those teeth nine feet out to get her class one. Because literally, it was nine feet that I had to get it. Then I had to flare the canines because these things were so pulled out. But I'm just moving everything out like this, okay? And so thus, I've got my designs for my class three. I've got my designs for class one. Again, I'm gonna send those over to my printer and again, we do 100% printed dentures now, which it's funny because if you asked me a year ago, I would have said never do printeds. I hated printeds. But with some of the materials that we have nowadays, these materials are getting so darn good, the fits are getting so darn good, which you'll see here in a sec, that I'm good with printed dentures now. I mean, I, help, I have a car develop their system, for heaven's sakes, to design these milled dentures, and I was a milled fanatic forever, but now, we do a ton of printed ones. And the reason why I'm okay making both of these sets of dentures for her is because when you kind of look at these, and we'll wait for my darn animation to go, I don't know why it's bogs here. There we go, two minutes after I clicked it. If we look at these, and I call this one the dog, like it looks like a dog jaw, kind of the class one, because it's just coming way out. But if you look at what it takes to be able to build these two sets of dentures, okay? all the corresponding parts, and we break up the dentures into its two corresponding parts, because these are the two corresponding <coughs> parts. I've got two bases, I've got two sets of teeth, okay? If you look at the cost of these, for both of these, I'm in $19. For both sets of white teeth, I'm in $8. So basically, for $13.46 and 30 minutes of extra work, I can make this other denture to see if she can tolerate a class one, okay? For me, that's worth it. It's 14 bucks. And I can either achieve her dream of having teeth that come out or give her some sweet party teeth, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> one or the other, because <laughs> let's be honest, that's what's going on. So, I go ahead and build them. First thing again, I'm trying in the class threes because I know these are gonna fit. I know she's gonna be happy. I know she's gonna be able to function well with these. So we try these things in, good fit. And again, this is visit two, okay? I just saw her the one time. This is now delivery, the second visit. PIP is great right out of the gate. We've got a very nice fit that way. Again, occlusion's right where I want it that way. And then the party teeth come. Put in the party teeth. Same fit when we look at her kind of face from everything. You look at the party teeth and you go, dude, they actually look pretty good. Again, the canines are a little bit weird because like I said, I had to flare them out to get them to clear down here. And when you look at, the, look at her face, it's very interesting what a difference it made. When I put this one in, she's like, oh yeah, that feels great, it looks good. 
Then I put, just putting this one in, she's like, oh my gosh, this feels really weird. She's like, my teeth feel like they're 10 feet out. I said, because they are 10 feet out. I'm like, your bone's way back there and the teeth have to be way out here. But again, it fits very well in with her face. And guess what? I just gave her both. And I said, look, you can wear whichever one you want. I don't care. Like, if, you, if you're going to a sweet party and want to look this way, do it. If you want to look this way for Halloween, now you've got something for Halloween. <laughs> but we were able to go ahead and build her something that, in a way, that we would never be able to do. Well, we could be able to do this from an analog perspective, but it would have taken a lot more time and a lot more expense to be able to do that. Okay? That's the power of digital. When you look at where we are from a characteristics, from the materials perspective, again, these are printed dentures, okay? These probably don't look like what you're used to from a printed denture perspective. You can make these things as hot or as terrible as you want them to be, okay? It's all up to what you or your lab has the ability to do. When we look at it <coughs> from a wear characteristics, Printer to mill teeth show significantly wet, less wear than conventional dental, denture teeth. They last longer. When you look at the mechanical properties, again, every paper out there known to man shows that they have significantly better mechanical properties than what we have been using clinically for the past hundred years. Okay? Now, with it, that's important because what do your patients like to do? They like to drop them in the sink. Okay? You drop them in the sink, they don't break. You decide to play cornhole with it down the hall, you can <laughs> chuck it, and guess what? They don't break. You can even, again, this is, we were bored over our, our students' spring break, you can even drop it off the second floor down onto our lobby. <laughs> and again, one of our students was hanging out with us, he's like, this is the best day ever. <laughs> so, doesn't break. Now, I can tell you, if you drop it off of a three-story balcony at your dental school down to concrete that it can't quite take that. It was oh so close with one of them. It bounced, it survived, and then the second bounce, like part of the flange broke off. I was so pissed because like it was literally like add one more floor and we're like this is the best day ever. We're just hucking dentures <laughs> off, of, off of the balcony. We're like it's material testing, like it's fine. So again, from a mechanical materials perspective, both milled and printed are significantly better than conventionals. Now, the final thing which we'll mention relative to this is just tissue adaptation. Okay, these were three different dentures I made. Print or milled here, printed here, and this was a conventional one I made about 12 years ago. Okay? When you look at the tissue adaptation or fit, there are a couple papers that directly compare printed versus milled. And what you see is this. Again, with a direct comparison between them, one paper shows that milled fits better. Two papers, these two show that there's no difference. One paper, this one, shows that printed is better. And every paper ever written shows that these are better versus conventional. These are the two latest, again, systematic reviews on it. They all show that they work better. OK, from a tissue adaptation slash fit perspective. And again, this is the type of fit that we have. And again, I made a diastema in this dude's denture. This is him trying to get it out. And just a normal denture, normal ridge. He'd been in a pair of dentures for the past 15 years. So it's not like he's got the best ridge ever. And he's just saying, I can't get it out. And I'm like, perfect. This is what I want. Yeah. I had so much fun building the diastema in this because he's like, can I get a diastema? I'm like, sure, man, no problem. So we can put this right down the center. And finally, he just says, you know what? I can't get it out. I'm giving up. He's like, I'll get it out later at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the type of fit you can get with these types of things. OK? So that's digital dentures. OK, well, we're going to switch gears. Um, from kind of the removable, so I skipped, I skipped an overdenture case because I figured let's get to fixed and to some of the other cool stuff that we can do here. So we're going to start off here with the complex cases and how we go about working up and planning these more complex cases, okay? And again, the way that you do these ones, come on computer, there we go. The way that we do these ones is the way to start 
is basically the exact same thing that we did on that first case. The principles are the same, okay? Where do teeth go? Where are we going to put the midline? Where are we going to put the occlusal plane? Where are we going to put all these different things? It's the exact same principles that you apply in the edentulous patient that you do in the fixed patient. The big question then is, again, how exactly do you go about doing this? And again, when they're completely edentulous like this, there's basically two ways, in my opinion, that you go about doing it. First is you make, the, the ideal is to make them a new denture. Okay, that way you've got a great fit on the thing, you know exactly where the teeth are gonna be, and you can move forward. The other, again, is like I mentioned just a second ago, either going kind of the digital wax rim, which is where you're gonna take their denture, and kind of move in that direction. Now, as I said, with all patients, what I generally do is I will scan their denture. And scanning dentures can sometimes be pretty tough, to be truly honest. You know, sometimes you can struggle, especially on the cameo surface on the palate. But I usually make sure that I get the, the intaglio surface to the best of my ability, then I kind of roll it over and start getting the teeth, getting everything else in that nature. And again, by the time we end up, we want something that looks like this. It's a copy of it. Now, I get asked the question all the time is, is there an easier or better way to do it? Okay, you know, do we just scan it like this? Do we put some powder on it? This is just some OptiSpray. Do we put that on it? Do we get a marker and tag the living crap out of it up like this and then scan it that way? Like, what is the best way to do it? And the reality is they're all bad, <laughs> okay? Nothing works better than anything else that I have seen, to be truly honest with you. Sometimes you can put a couple of little dabs of composite, and I've got some composite here for a different reason, which we'll talk about here in just a sec. But nothing works better than the other. If you look at this dab to paper, it does show you that, again, the best way you can duplicate a denture is digitally, okay? Better than making the clamshells that we've made over time or different things like that or using denture duplicators. Like, part on the best way to do it is scan it and then move forward from there. Okay, but again, as far as the mechanisms of how you're going to scan it, to be honest, we haven't found that one of these ways works better than the other. Now, we've got these little dots here is because, again, for the fully edentulous patient and our surgical planning, what we're going to do is, again, we're going to do what's called the dual scan protocol, where you've got to have some sort of fiduciaries. And in this particular one, I use composite dots. Usually, I do something like this, which are glass beads with a little bit of sticky wax. This is my ideal way of doing it because it makes it one, look like the denture of the future, which is pretty cool with all these things there. And two, it's just really easy to pop it off and then you just re, you know, sterilize the beads and go from there. But unfortunately, my residents had either stolen or lost all of my glass beads, like they tend to do. And so that's why in this particular one, I had to just throw on some composite, okay? But the reality is on these edentulous patients where they have a denture, we're going to take two CBCTs, or this is what's called the dual scan, as I'm sure pretty much most of you are aware in the room of how to do this type thing. And the reason why these fiduciary markers are so darn important is because when you get the CBCT in there, again, from a thresholding perspective, you start to see where everything is lined up that way through those fiduciary markers. Because if you didn't, and you had to threshold it all the way out, the problem is then you're not going to be able to see the bone because you're gonna have to expose all, you know, make it change it so much so that you can see the denture. And again, that's gonna also bring all the skin and everything into it. On this particular patient, we also facial scan the patient. <sighs> you know, I, facial scanning is like the new cool thing to do. Like she, I don't know, the, these always look like the Han Solo like in carbonite looking <laughs> things, you know, it's like, ah. And this is with a really expensive facial scanner, which is great because it can actually show good definition of the teeth. <laughs> I have a buddy that loves 3D facial scans. I like planning more off of 2D, to be honest with you, than, than using the facial scans. I think facial scans are great things for us to put up on a podium and be like, check out how awesome this is. But I don't find it as useful from a planning perspective because most of the time, the teeth are coming flared back just because of the way that the facial scanners generally work and so they're hard to merge. But again, it is a nice adjunct thing. There was a paper that just came out a couple weeks ago that was saying, you know, from an occlusal perspective, if you were going to open the bite up more than five millimeters, it was actually helpful to have a facial scan because then you can actually use some of the extra oral landmarks to help you 
position things a little bit better. But that would require a good facial scanner like this one's the Artec Spider and that's what we use for that. But the bottom line is whether you have it 2D, 3D, whatever, you still have to go through the basics just like we did in the last case, okay? So when we look at her midline, midline's off, okay? Teeth are skewed over on her. When we look at occlusal plane, you know, and again, that's why I like having a picture with the eyes in there. When we look at the occlusal plane, she's got a reverse smile line going on. When we look at her lip at rest picture, you know, again, the teeth are right there. Generally, females are going to show two to four millimeters of, of tooth. So we're gonna have to increase the incisal edge length of those dentures. So how do you do this with this digital wax rim? We've got this denture that's in there that doesn't have the teeth which we want. So the easiest way I've found to do it is you just scan the denture as I showed earlier, you put it into your software, you digitally remove the teeth, and then you just re-wax new teeth right back on top of there, okay? Because it's gonna have the same base, it's gonna have everything and allow you to be able to merge this back into your software. So when we look at kind of the changes that we made, where the teeth originally were here is in this kind of overlay, and we brought them down and over so that we can correct the midline problem. We can correct the occlusal plane problem in that we no longer have this reverse smile curve going on and we've made things longer. Now, when we look at the 2D versus 3D kind of trials of the two of them, again, I can toggle them on and off. I can kind of see where things are going. Again, Han Solo is looking okay through here, but again, a little bit harder to see. But what I can do is I can take all these different files and then again, I can just stack them in Simplant, okay? And what I'll do is I'll just skip it to here because I've got my dual scan CBCT. I've got my original denture STL merged to this. I've got the soft tissue. Then I have my new denture with my new tooth positions in there merged to this, okay? So now I know exactly where I'm going from this particular scan, okay? Now, who cares? What do we do with it now at this point? So, how do we go ahead and plan these types of cases, okay? Whether this is a full arch, you know, and again, we're specifically going to work on full arch fixed, but the way this also would work with overdentures, this would work with whatever, okay? For complex planning, what I like to use is this thing I call the three A's protocol. And we're going to plan everything. The first A is from the abutment perspective, okay? Because we need to know where the abutments are. The, you know, if you're, we're using angled abutments or different things like that, your implants can be all over the place, but the abutments just need to be lined up like a picket fence so that everything draws prosthetically. So it's really important to at least know where you're going from the abutment perspective. Then the second A is making sure we have adequate space for whatever you are doing restoratively. And the third is making sure everything is aligned. Okay, those are the three different things. Now the reason why adequate space is so darn important is because it doesn't matter what you, what material you use, everything will break if you don't have adequate restorative space. There is no unobtainium, you know, or sweet metal that like won't break with a lack of space. Like there was one week in practice where, and luckily these weren't mine, they were ones sent in from the community, but we had a broken, we had this broken metal acrylic, we had a broken uh, PFM full arch, and then we had a broken zirconia hybrid all that same week, okay? Most of them are lack of, lacks of space. So we'll talk about how much space is adequate. And again, from an alignment perspective, we need to make sure everything's aligned so you don't have screw access holes coming in places you don't want screw access holes. Okay, this was even with 30 degree angle change abutments on there, they're still coming out there, okay? Stuff happens, I understand, you know, when we're in the heat of battle, sometimes doing surgery, stuff happens. And, you know, that is okay, but if we can try to not run into those problems, that is quite helpful. So again, when we're planning these cases, again, I use a lot of these smart fix abutments. They come in a zero, a 17, and a 30 degree. And why I really love Simplant is because, again, if we're doing this type of case, we can actually plan the implants with the abutments directly on there. If I'm planning a locator case, I can put all, there was actually just this morning, I ordered a guide for a four implant locator case. And again, I was able to plan all the locators on there to know what height my locators needed to be. So you just plan everything according to the abutment that you will actually be trying to put on the top of there. Now from there, that's when you start looking at adequate space. Well, how much space is adequate? 
Well, it completely depends upon the restorative modality you're going to use, okay? If you're using overdentures, you need seven to eight millimeters of space because you've got to put your locator on, you've got to put your, your top on the top of it, your housing, and then you need two millimeters of acrylic over the top of that. If you're doing a fixed case, you need about 10 millimeters. If you're doing a Zerk hybrid, it's between 10 and 12. PFM hybrid's the same. Metal acrylic, you need at least 15. Conus, again, they say you can get down to 12, but I still think you need about 15 millimeters of space to stack everything. And if you're doing trefoil, if, if anyone's still doing trefoil, I think that came and went, Novum 2.0. But you need 22 for that, which is crazy. Like that's cutting off half of the face. Well, that's cutting off much more than half of the face, but you need the required space. And when you figure this out, isn't when you're going to restore it. It's before you lay the finger on the patient, you need to figure this part out. Because if you thought you were gonna do a metal acrylic, yet you've only got reduction for a fixed case, all of a sudden that case got a whole lot more expensive to the patient or to you if you've got to eat those costs, okay? So that's why we want to make sure we're doing the type of surgery relative to the restorative platform. Well, not restorative platform, but the restorative modality that we're shooting for, okay? Now, when we look at adequate space on this, <coughs> this particular one, zirconia hybrid, again, we've got plenty of space. This is about 12 millimeters to there because the average central is about 10 millimeters. So we've got plenty on this particular case. Final thing is alignment. And again, with this is just making sure that all the abutments are aligned relative to a path of draw. And again, I may bring this one up because this is kind of interesting. And th what I'm going to bring up, this is no right or wrong answer to this. But this has just been something that I've been doing a lot more when I plan these things lately is again, here we've got everything kind of lined up like a picket fence. When you look at it though, if you look kind of, everything's a little bit cocked forward. Did you notice that at all? Like I've got everything kind of canted a little bit forward. And the reason being is because, again, we know the bone in the front is kind of canted forward as well. So I've got it more canted forward like that. It's funny how I used to always plan these cases is I'd plan them straight up and down axially. And when I do that, again, this is what it looks like. And this is much more pleasing to our brains, like just looking at it because it's kind of straight up and down versus cocked a little bit forward. But the reason why I've, over the past probably four years or so, I've gone a lot more to this configuration is because the problem is if we put them straight up and down, where the bone is a lot of times in the anterior here ends up being really palatal. So we've got this big overlap here. Whereas by cocking them forward, I, I tried, and again, this is how I used to always do it from a freehanded perspective is I'd find the worst angle, which is usually right here in the anterior and then parallel everything to that. Okay. And so that's why by doing that, I'm able to decrease the overlap significantly here versus something like this where I'm going to have to go to here. Now, you'll see on the provisional, I've got, it, I've got it thick through here, and that's just so that we have bulk so that it doesn't break, okay? But on the final, we move it more towards this direction, okay? And again, it's just kind of an interesting thing because, again, that's where it would have to go versus that's where it's going to have to go, and that's a lot of overlap, okay? So I do the same thing with this that we do, did with that first case, and instead of ordering, you know, I order my guide, then instead of ordering my my custom abutment, I order what's called the Immediate Smiles Digital, which is this little thing you can get from Atlantis. And so thus what it does is it sends me all these, all these core files, okay? Same type principle that we saw earlier, but for full arch. And what I'm able to do is I'm able to take this one with the tissue with the abutments and then go ahead and design my little provisional, okay? Just a couple of the nuances. And again, I've got the holes already cut so that we'll seat come with my temporary abutments coming right through there, or my temporary cylinders, I guess I should say. But we've got everything looking like this, and just a couple of the little design nuances. You need at least a three millimeter connector or so from here, just so that there's strength. If you look at the temporary cylinder, it's five millimeters wide at the base, it's about 12 millimeters tall. So I generally make these five millimeters, these holes, okay? And then again, on this particular one, I didn't bring the gums all the way to full contour because I was just going to quickly layer on some gums, okay? So I take this design. At this particular point, I'm going to go ahead and put it into the mill, mill it all out. Again, it's looking pretty hot there in the puck. 
I go ahead and cut it out of the puck and this is how awesome it looks. And I put milled? Because look at the facial. It's not even close. Like here's my design. <laughs> looks exactly the same, right? <laughs> Perfect. Slap it in the mouth. We're good to go. Problem is this is a thing called curtaining, which sometimes can happen on the facial surfaces depending upon how you nest it in the puck. And again, it did the intaglio surface well. It did every surface well except for the facial. And that can happen sometimes. And it's a really real bummer when it is, when that does happen. And it's especially a real bummer when the surgery, I can't remember if it was later that day or the next morning. So I didn't have time to remill it, okay? So I was like, oh crap, no time. So I'm gonna now kind of block carve, because this is my issue with this one as I ran into these, these problems. So I've now got to kind of block carve this sucker. So I just marked real quickly where my teeth should be, took a burr, cut it out that way, took a disc, went ahead and opened up the embrasures, started making it look like teeth. At that point, I'm gonna do my Bob Ross and start painting all these lovely incisal edges, get it some color to make it start looking nice. And then the final thing, and I could have done a little bit better job festooning, but I was kind of out of time, is I just took some triad just rolled it up, thumbed it in there to festoon it, and then I hit it with the toothbrush to give it the stippling, and then cured it, okay? And that's how we got the gum tissue to look like the gum tissue. So, and again, took it from something that looked, come on, something that looked like that, you know, to transform it to look like this in probably, it's probably about 20 minutes or so, okay? And that's one of the things that you have to realize, man, our technicians do such an awesome job because like stuff comes out of a mill or a printer, sometimes not as awesome as you want. And it's then up to them with their artistry or you up to you with your artistry to be able to make it into something that's good. So let's go to do the surgery on this particular one. Again, here's my guide and again, one of the other lectures this morning was talking about putting windows in it. I always put windows kind of on my edentulist guides like this, right in these spots. That way, when I seat them, I A, know that everything's seated because I can see through on these windows, and B, if I ever need to re-inject palatally, I am right over my anatomy to be able to do that and cover the entire lingual portion of the arch. So on this particular one, was able to do it flapless. Again, a lot of times I will open this up and do it that way, then close it down. But this one I was able to do flapless. And you know, implants are in, we kind of think we're done. You know, we've got these little three sixes up in the front. We've got four twos in the back. But the reality is, again, all we've done is drill the hole that's 3.6 millimeters in diameter and put the implant in. <coughs> well, what about this bone? Has anybody ran into that bone when you're trying to put on any of your multi-units or anything like that? You have, unless you're using the uni button. I actually put a uni abutment case in at the very end just for you. So, but again, I don't, I don't know if we'll get that far into it, but. So, what about this bone? Okay, that's where we run into the problems. We screw it in, we're like, oh yeah, that's tight. Then you take your x-ray and you're like, ah, oh, suck. I'm holding up on the bone right there. That's when, again, I don't know about you guys, but if this is 3.6, does anybody know the diameter of these? It's 4.8. Pretty much every multi-unit abutment on the market is either a 4.6 or a 4.8, okay? So again, the, the smart fixes are 4.8. In this instance, if this is a 3.6 hole and that's a 4.8, the way I get around that extra bone and take care of it is I use the reamer tool. This is literally one of my favorite things in the entire world is this because again, that part just goes right down into the implant and it's a little trephine. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the pictures I took of her, so this is a different patient just showing it, but you just screw it in, use the reamer, go down until it kind of goes all the way down like that till the end. That takes out kind of that extra little bit of bone, and then everything goes down there and seats just fine, okay? That's the great thing about it. So go ahead and do that, and it's funny. So when you, whenever you're doing a pickup where you've got something with pre-made, pre-drilled holes, the time to try it in is not at this point. Seat it down on the tissue when you've got the abutments there because that way you can get your mirror and you can look at it and make sure that they're coming through the holes. Because the problem is if you put your temporary copings on, 
Then you try to seed it and all of a sudden it's hanging up here and it's hanging up here and you're not really exactly sure where to start cutting because it's kind of, you're like shimming it on. Well, if you can look at it beforehand, before you put those on, just seed it down, look with, with your mirror and then you can say, okay, yeah, I got to grind a little bit, you know, more mesial on this one, a little bit more distal on this one. If you don't even see one, just grab some bite registration, squirt it in there, seed it, pop it off and then look at it from the intaglio perspective and see where that impression was and just drill right through it, okay? So anyway, at this point, put those things on, everything's coming through kind of right where we plant it. Again, this one was just shy. This was at like 23 and I was like, dude, I'm not loading it because it's a terminal one. And if we get to the last case, you'll see why because that one is a cluster and that's why hopefully we get to that case because it's awesome. It's just a nightmare. Pick everything up. Again, here's the conversion. I could have done a little bit better with contouring up here, to be truly honest. And it was funny because I had two of my residents in the room and I put this thing in and like, then we looked at her smile and they're like, oh my gosh, it took like years off of her life. Like it made her look much younger because when you just look at this denture that looks like a denture with a reverse smile, then you put something in that looks like teeth. It completely changed the dynamic of her. So, and again, I finished up this case and then I moved right after the fact. But again, it's good case to show how you can plan these things and some of the different modalities that you can have. Let me change PowerPoints real quick because last night my PowerPoint, I'm trying to save it at like 11 o'clock at night and it was uh, crashing and crashing and crashing and crashing. And so that's why I had to break this up into two parts. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to run through a handful of full arch cases, okay? And this is, we're going to look at how to execute these, especially from a restorative perspective differently than we've done them before, okay? And so with this, I think we've got this tendency, especially with full arch, to kind of do the things that we've always done, which if, if, if you even go back to the way Branamark did this, we're still restoring them in the same way. We've got all these different steps. You know, you take your conventional impression, you pour up the sweet model with your soft tissue moulage, you make a verification jig. After that goes in, then you try in the bar, that goes in, you go ahead and make a wax thing, that goes in, you put teeth on the wax thing, that goes in. And 90 visits later, you actually have a prosthesis, okay? Well, how can we use our technology differently to help us speed up some of these things, kind of similar to what we saw with the denture perspective? We're going to look at how some of these tools we've actually optimized to be able to help with this. First tools we're going to need, again, prime scan with a minimum of 5.2, but the 5.3 software. And again, we developed this scan body specifically for this. Okay, it's the IO Flow S, which fits on the, on the smart fix abutments. On the cases you're going to see today, no verifications, no wax trines, no anything like that. And we're going to use this concept called the Lannis Bridge Base, okay, which you've already seen two variations of the core files. This is the final kind of most crazy variation of the core file where we're going to take the core file of the actual bar and build things on it before we actually get the bar in our hand, okay? And what I'm going to try to show you guys today are just four different restorative workflows, okay? Because that way you can choose, again, everybody's different the way you're going to do these cases, okay? And what I wanted to try to do is show the whole spectrum of what you can do here. It all starts out with, again, the core file of the bar. From there, we get the bar made. And again, one restorative workflow, and I'd say this is the modernized metal acrylic, is we get the bar. I'll print out the gums, then I'll take carded teeth and put carded teeth in, okay? That's one way. Not the way I do very frequently, to be truly honest, okay? Because I hate carded teeth with a passion. Because I don't like carded teeth popping off, which is what carded teeth like to do, okay? Second way is, I like to call this one the modular monolithic, okay? We've got the bar made, and again, I'm doing two different versions on the patients. One is, again, printed gums with printed or milled teeth over the top, and that's metal acrylic, or going zirconia over the bar, okay? Both kind of, I call them modular monolithic. 
And sometimes you don't have space for bars. So then we're going to go with something like this, which is what we're more used to from an FP1 type perspective. Okay? So these are the different workflows which you're going to see here at the end. And like I say, hopefully I can get through these quick enough so I can show you just an absolute cluster of a case where I screwed up literally every step known to man. Okay? Now, with these patients, there are three very different patients that are coming in with three completely different rationales. Okay? So that's what's very interesting about them is the three are very, very, very different, the rationale of why they're coming in. So let's start with her. Okay, this is patient number one. This is Dawn. She saw me kind of pre-pandemic. She says, I hate my smile. I've been to all these places. I need to get stuff done. And you know, when you look at her from a smile perspective, you know, she, it doesn't look that great, but it doesn't look that bad. It's when you start getting into the mouth that you start to see what the real issues are. And especially when you look at it from a retracted perspective, it's pretty tough, okay? She's got some perio issues. She's got some cracked teeth. She's got some PA lesions around. She's got some pretty severe issues. My original thought was, okay, let's try to save everything. Let's do some orthognathics, try to move things that way. When I went and explored that with my surgeons, they were like, no way. Like, that's not going to happen. And I said, okay, well, the other option is we prosthodontically move everything and we slick both arches and move things prosthetically and we build you implant solutions that way. And she, she was fine with that. And then she goes, man, this kind of freaks me out. She's very, you know, nervous about things. And she's like, well, I'm going to hold off. So the pandemic hits and she loves the pandemic. The reason why is because she's wearing a mask all the time. Nobody can see her teeth, okay? Once the pandemic is ending and we're getting rid of masks, she's super sad. She's coming in saying, look, masks are coming off. Like, I can't deal. Like, I just can't deal with this. Like, I, I have to do it. So I say, okay, what we're going to do, we go and do the lower arch first. I take everything off. Go ahead and, and put our guided implants in. We put those in. I do a conversion kind of similar to what you just saw. Again, this was with kind of a stackable guide. So this was stacked in, converted it that way. And then on the upper arch, if you saw how deficient she was in that left part of the arch, I picked four teeth, prepped those four teeth, took out the teeth. We bone grafted everything out and moved her into a printed provisional on the top for the full arch so that our bone graft wouldn't get, you know, rammed out of her head with the denture. She heals up with that. And we notice we're still deficient on bone on the top. So we go through and at that point we've got to take out teeth, take out the rest of her teeth. One of my residents was like, hey, can I, I want to try making a digital denture. I said, sure, that's fine. So he makes a digital denture, first one he ever made out of a different software than we normally make it. This picture still bums me out, but he got it for my patient and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> And this is the digital denture which she got made. She doesn't love it. She doesn't hate it either, but we needed to do that so we could do a second round of grafting to build some more bone where she was still deficient. Now, again, I go back to this of make dentures great again. We can make them hot. So I wish we had more time because I could have spent more time kind of helping him make that thing a lot better. But he just kind of struggled. He could do the three shape way well, but couldn't do the exocad way well at all. So. Let's go through the workflow of if you want to do this type of case digitally, how do you do it? Okay, this is how we do it. First off, scan the opposing arch. Okay, next, scan your seated temporary prosthesis. From there, scan the bite. And then again, this is like what we do with everybody, like normal patients, right? The difference is here, scan the soft tissue and the heads of the multis and then scan the scan bodies. So that is kind of the workflow of how you do it and how you're going to set it up in your machine. Okay. Now, if you have prime scan, this is how you set it up in prime scan. Okay. Usually do it in connect. You can also just do it in the standard software and then just export everything out. But basically what you do is again, this lower jaw is going to be the temp. Okay. That's our working arch and again, you always want your working arch with the temp because that's how you get your bite. Okay. Where some people have screwed up this workflow 
is they put you know the scan bodies here and then they're trying to register the bite back to here and it doesn't work okay so you've got to put that whatever your working arch is that's your temporary okay then you got to add the catalog for the gingival mask because it will already put in the scan body for you so just like you've seen first thing i start off with is i'm going to go ahead and scan wash the denture scan the denture okay so we've got that all washed, scanned, ready to go, because again, that's my opposing arch. Then at that point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop down to the lower, scan the temporary prosthesis, okay? So we go through, scan this. Again, you've seen probably a million scans today, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time showing you the scans, but this is kind of what we want. Now, there are some very important parts that you want for this. You wanna make sure you can try to get as much facial tissue as you can and again, get back to the kind of the retromolar pads. It's a little bit higher up. I was struggling, but get back here past this so that you can have some common landmarks. Now, when you look at these things and we look at it from an accuracy perspective, why we start off scanning something like teeth is because that's the most accurate thing we can scan currently. When you look at this, this is from two different ones of our papers. Again, bunch of different scanners on here. Bottom line is the smaller the box plot, the more accurate things are, okay? And when we look at this, and again, this was from an in vitro study that we did off of some models, we saw that, you know, with the prime scan for dentate scans, which is what this in essence is simulating, you can get down to about 18 microns of cross arch accuracy, which is pretty insane. But again, that's from a desktop study. When we look at it from a clinical type study, and you look at her scan here and scan here, the closest thing that we have in the literature, and again, from our data, is this. Again, we do these cadaver studies where we take cadavers in various situations. We scan them with an ATOS capsule scanner, which is an industrial scanner that can scan down to about two microns of precision. So it's about the best way to get yourself a mean, and then you compare all the other scanners to it. It's funny, the first one we did, and this is what we were talking about back in Germany back in the day, like, and I was keeping it quiet because like our study design was different than any other way we do it. It cost us $3,000 for one stupid scan. And like we had to just convince this company, they're like, you want us to scan what? We're like, it's cool, man. It's a maxilla. They're like, like someone's mouth? We're like, yeah. They're like, we're not doing that. We're like, come on, you know, do it. And so they're like, and I think they just threw out this number to like see like, $3,000, because you guys will never do it, you know, give us the bird. We're like, okay, and then we got grants and bought it, and they're like, then they came and scanned it, they're like, that was the coolest thing ever. It shows up on their website and all this stuff. Now they're like super amped to work with us for this. But again, when we scan this, our latest study, which again, we're just prepping this right now, is we went and scanned it with all of our different scanners, went and scanned it, then we also took 100 million impressions of it as well. And when we looked at these things, when you look at conventional impressions versus scans, again, in real life situations, 40 microns of cross arch accuracy with that, 37 microns here for the actual conventional way of doing things, okay? We're within three friggin' microns of difference between the two, that's nothing, okay? When you look at the systematic reviews relative to these things, again, this. This paper right here, I think it was Bar Barn Days or what is it, Ben Delays. There was absolutely no difference in accuracy from the scanning to conventional. There was absolutely no difference when they made things off of that between the two, between marginal adaptation and gingival gap. But where there was a huge difference was in this. Significantly, significantly more comfortable to the patient to have an intraoral scan versus conventional impressions. Okay? So again, our data shows it from the granular side, this shows it from what we see in the body of the literature, and that's what I'm going to try to show you as we go through these things. Final basic scan that we do is, again, scan the occlusion of the patient. Go ahead and scan both arches. Get it all in like this. You get the sweet, awesome thing that looks like alien right here. We're ready to go. Now, what does the data show us relative to digital occlusion? And this is very interesting, because when you look at this, there was this wonderful paper at the end of last year by Reese, which looked at this. And what they were looking at was intraoral scanning occlusion versus two different types of PVS. One was a scannable PVS, one was just a normal PVS. And what they were looking for was mandibular deviation, because that's where we see the problems with when things are off from a scanning perspective. Well, what you see is this. 
again, from the intraoral scan perspective, it was off by about 50 microns, whereas the PVS was off by nearly a half millimeter each time when you mount it, okay? And when you look at then, you go from this, the granular data, down to, again, the Shadid paper, which is the systematic review on it, they looked at, there was 14 different papers in the subject. And again, there was absolutely conventional did not beat digital, okay? And what they showed was from the conventional perspective, almost all of them were off about that half millimeter of space. It was very, very interesting. So there's nothing to fear whatsoever with doing these things digitally from a bite perspective either, okay? Now, let's move on to here. Take off the prosthesis. Now we're going to scan, scan this. And again, as you can see, I'm, I'm honestly deliberately starting with the lower arch because everyone's like, oh, you can do an upper. You can't do the lower. Well, that's why we're starting with the lower arch. Okay, and it is harder. But when we go ahead and scan this, again, with the tissue, just go through, scan the case. Again, try to keep the patient as stable as possible. So we go through, scan things, and this is what we want. Something that looks like this. You want the exact same landmarks that you had before. Okay, so you can merge them back together. Now, one word of caution, okay? If this is your first time ever scanning something this big, don't start with this arch, okay? It's much, much, much harder, okay? Start with the upper arch. Here's an upper arch, just another patient of mine, scanning the upper arch, cruising through here. Literally, this total scan time took 33 seconds, okay? That's where you wanna start, is you wanna start with an upper, because it's much, much easier. You've got a lot of good tissue, You've got a lot of different things to be able to do it very well on the upper arch. Compare and contrast that to literally the hardest scan I have ever done in my entire life, which was this one, okay? And this is sped up to 10 times speed because this took me, I think it was 20, 26 minutes to scan this lady's lower, because hell or high water, I was getting this. <laughs> but the reality is, again, the curb down there was so thin, Basically, the entire floor of the mouth covered the arch. So I had my, one of my assistants kind of holding back with two mirrors, trying to hold the tongue back as I'm scanning and going across the front. It was a royal pain in the A. Like, it was the hardest thing ever. But again, we were doing it as part of testing. So I'm like, dude, we're doing it. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, we're doing it on you. And again, we finally got it there. But when you, that's not where you want to start, okay? That's the bottom line. Don't start on those cases. Start with the uppers. Now, when you look at it, edentulous accuracy from this perspective, again, this was another one of our cadaver studies. The closest thing we can find to this is a completely edentulous one. And what we see from the prime scan is it's about 80 microns off in a positive direction, okay? Whereas again, we were kind of talking about this during the break. What PVS does is PVS will actually intrude it about 100 microns. So the swing between digital to PVS is about 180 microns to 200 microns, depending on your scanner. That way, if you're doing, for example, a denture, like you talked about earlier, you're saying, well, everything was just a little bit shy. The reason why it's a little bit shy is because, again, if the lab's used to building everything from an analog perspective, you've now introduced 200 microns of space. Well, of course, it's going to be a little bit shy because you're using a different modality. Does that make sense to everybody? So you have to tell the lab, okay, go ahead and tighten up the tolerances a little bit to account for that space, okay? Because that's just what PVS does is it pushes and it intrudes that tissue, and it intrudes it, like I say, between about 101 to 110 microns. I'm a freaking nerd, man, that I know that. But again, that was from one of our papers, so that's why. All right, final scan is going ahead and scanning the scan bodies, okay? The biggest thing with this, and I'm just gonna kind of speed through here to here. Biggest thing which you want with your scan body scans is just making sure you're registering the anatomy of the scan bodies, okay? Now, I get asked this all the time, well, how good is this scan? If you just started with that, well, how good's this? Well, luckily we have another cadaver study that, again, I placed four different implants on this cadaver and I placed them in kind of different configurations. So there's two on this side, three on this side that were tighter so we could kind of measure some differences and stuff. And again, did the exact same thing. And what we see with the prime scan, and again, this what the prime scan was the highest accurate scanner for this that there is. 
it was at 43 microns of cross arch accuracy, which is kind of insane. And I, so I get asked this all the time, well, is that good enough? And the reality is, what I say is, say, I don't really know, to be honest. I think it is. But if you look at the data relative to these things, the only paper that there is relative to passivity of fit is this one by Yoxted from 2015 that said, you know, they were looking at bar misfits and stuff, and we've actually got a master's thesis for one of the residents on this right now. But they showed, you know, at even 100 microns of misfit, it still maintained passivity. Okay? So it was very kind of interesting. It wasn't until it got up to about the 230 to 280 micron range where it started to get, it's, it was no longer passive. Okay? But what they saw was even though it was no longer passive, the bar still fit and it still worked. Okay? But what this highlights is kind of the importance of what we were talking about earlier, and you said just wait until after the lecture. When you look at scan patterns on these things, and we kind of saw this a little bit earlier, what we have found with the prime scan is there's kind of two scan patterns which work the best for this. And I put both of them up here because the reality is sometimes clinically, one may be a little bit different and a little bit easier to use than the other one. Okay? But the one is start lingually, go lingually, come back across kind of occlusally, then go facially. The other one is start here in the middle and you go lingual, then kind of like lingual occlusal, then you go buccal occlusal, then you come back here to the midline, go lingual occlusal, buccal occlusal, then you come back and fill in the rest. Both of them work. Both of them are going to give you the most accurate way to develop your digital models because you have to realize that the way digital models are made and everything is built, accuracy comes from two things. One is the accuracy <coughs> of your scanner, which is kind of like the resolution of your iPhone. You know, the cameras get better and better and better and better. The <coughs> other is the algorithmic accuracy, which is the math to actually be able to build the digital models. And if you're not giving the math in the proper way, you can start to get some warping of the models and you don't even know you've got warping of the models. And we found this out in 2016 with the trios because we're looking at our data going, dude, none of this makes sense. And that's when we started doing these scan pattern studies. And what we found was kind of the proper scan pattern for the trios was this way, start lingually, go occlusal and go buccally. Well, at that particular time, if you did just the opposite, you started buccally, when occlusally, back lingually, you lost 100 microns of precision just right there. And you had no clue. Okay? But that's why we want to scan them in the proper way. And the beautiful thing about this from a digital perspective is that everything comes in cross arch mounted. Like that is worth its weight of gold from the laboratory side because there was nothing I hated more as a tech than cross arch mounting like 100 models. You know, it was just very hard to make sure everything comes in at the exact same cross arch mounting. Well, it all does here from the digital side. Now, if you or your lab don't want to go fully digital and you really want to model or you really still want to have the comfort of a conventional impression, and again, I didn't on this particular one, all these are all digital, but just snap an impression and send that along because your lab can pour that up and your lab can digitally match this to here, okay? There's no problem with jumping in and out wherever you need to go. Just play to your lab strengths and how you guys want to go about doing the workflow. Now, I will mention one final thing about accuracy, then we'll move on, because Martin had talked to me. He's like, hey, can you talk about some of this stuff? And it's very interesting, because if you look at it, there's two systematic reviews on full arch implant scans and restorative work. This is one of them, OK? And it's real interesting because basically what it's doing is it's doing this. It's comparing this to this. And when you just look at this, and again, this was from last year. When you just look at it, this is what it says. Conclusion. And this is what we all do, right? We just like PubMed it and Google it and like look it up and go, based on the results of the included studies, full arch digital implant impressions taken using intraoral scanners are not sufficiently accurate for clinical application. We go, well, son of a bee, that lying jerk. <laughs> comes from Utah saying all this stuff and he's totally wrong okay well it's really interesting because if you dive into this and this is what we do with papers a lot of times we just read that abstract and we go boom gospel and move on well if you actually read this paper it's very interesting because that's their conclusion and again I'm still not sure how this one got through the editors to be honest 
because that's their conclusion. But you look at the results, and again, they've got a whole section where they're comparing digital to analog directly. And when you look at the direct comparison, it's very interesting. Oh, man, you can't even see my seven. There's a seven over there, right here in the middle. Okay? There were seven papers. Okay? And when it looked at the direct comparison in it, guess what? Five of the papers showed that digital beat to the two of physical. So what? So reason this conclusion out to me. It says digital isn't good enough, yet digital beat analog five out of seven times. What that also means is that physical isn't good enough according to their criteria. Does that make sense? And it's so funny because their criteria, if you look at it, was they had this arbitrary, they said, quoted in such and such paper, it needs to be 100 microns or less. So I said, OK, what paper is this? Because all these people keep quoting this paper. So I went and found the paper. I looked it up. Guess how they came up with 100? It wasn't due to a misfit like Yogstead's paper was. It was a bar overdenture paper with two implants down here. And they said, you know what? Each implant can move in the bone 50 microns. So 50 plus 50 is 100. <laughs> Thus, everything's got to be under 100 microns. Had absolutely nothing to do whatsoever with misfit. Had absolutely nothing to do with passivity had absolutely nothing to do with anything else. And that's where, the, that's where the 100 microns came from, which is very interesting when you actually look at how it is. Because we all quote that paper for these things when it's kind of an apple and an orange to really what we're talking about. Again, part of what we're trying to find right now is we've got scans at all different micron levels because of problem, you know, because of misfit with, or not misfit, but imprecisions with scans. So we've got all these things at different scan levels at 50, 100, 150. You know, again, not exactly like 50, 100, 150, et cetera. But we've got them all the way up to about 400 microns. And so part of this project we're doing right now is building bars at all of those and putting them back on and doing blind testing to see at what level do all of us from a passivity test and a one screw test perspective say, OK, that, because we all know what it feels like. You know, when you're screwing something down, you're like, mm. I'm shimming this one in, and now this screw's going in, and now this one's going in. We all know that feeling, but we don't know at, the, at what threshold that actually is in reality. So that's why we're kind of trying to find these things. But again, five out of the seven, one by digital. If you look at the latest systematic review, which came out just this year, it was six, six for digital, four with no difference, four for analog. Okay, very interesting. So I know that was an all aside, but I just found it so fascinating of, of where it kind of came from. Now, let's look specifically at what has been done with the software. Because if you look at my scan for, for our patient, you'll notice a couple little error problems in here. So let's look at the screenshot from this side. You see something that you generally don't see on, on scanners, OK? You see these holes right here and right here. Well, why are there holes? And again, you may not have noticed this once you upgrade it up to 5.2 and 5.3, but there's holes, OK? And what those holes are is what the scanner used to do and what pretty much every scanner on the market does is it interpolates data, OK? What that means is, again, if you've got an area like this where you've got a wall coming up like this and a wall on top like this, the scanner goes, oh, I got this. It's here, OK? And it connects the dots. And we've all seen that where it's kind of rounded out in different areas because it's filling it in for you. Well, what's the problem with that? The problem with it, and the only way I've been able to figure out how to kind of explain the problem with interpolating data, is this. When you look at this, when you're missing data, I want all of you to fill in what the missing data is here in your mind. OK? What's the word you come up with? There's all sorts of different words. Pump, lump, dump, rump, jump. I used to actually have a different four-letter word there, which made it very much more interesting. But I'm like, I probably can't put that one up on a big screen. But by filling in and interpolating the data that is missing, it wildly can change the connotation of the word. And it's a similar thing with scanning. And that's what we have noticed. That's why in these later versions of the software, it no longer fills in that data 
because as you fill in the data, the problem is, again, this is a different patient, different scanner, same scan bodies. Do you notice how this wall goes up, it's, it's cocked in there, it goes up, then it's cocked out there? It's because of the interpola interpolation of the data. We go over to this side, it's tucked in here, it's tucked in here. Okay, we can see, and at least you can hear me clicking, which is great. We've got some issues coming through there. You can see how that's cocked. And again, that's what almost every scanner on the market does and what our scanner on the market used to do prior to this update. And the problem with that is if it's starting to warp the scan body, what you've then got to do from the lab side is you've got your digital analog here that you've got to then merge to this. And with it being warped, what it does is then it can merge off ever so slightly but again, ever so slight merge issues or ever so slight deviations that we see, the problem is those accumulate and add up to create inaccuracies downstream, okay? Because once the merge is set, that's where your digital analog comes from, that's where it tells us where everything is, that's where we build our bar off of is from the digital side of this, and that's where we run into problems. That's why the new software doesn't do that with the data, okay? And when we looked at ours, even though I had those holes in it, we still had a 97% merge alignment. And from that perspective, I'm fine building the bar on it pre-op, okay? So we build the bar on it, completely digital, completely virtual, and run through a similar workflow that you saw with the digital dentures, okay? Gonna design things, we've designed the pink, we've got carded teeth in this particular one, and again, we're going kind of a modular approach where we've got the bar, We've got the gum tissue printed out, and then we've got just simple carded teeth placed in there. And then basically what happens is this comes in the mail from Atlantis, and we put the two of those, glue the two of those together, okay? So that the final lower prosthesis looks like this. It's the conventional metal acrylic that we've all done forever. The digital denture on the top is made in a similar fashion. Again, just modularly made. These are both, the, these are both printed out from carbons. This is the Lucitone print. Print both of those out. Again, digital denture goes in. Again, we've got a good fit with it. Same deal, I'm tugging on this lady's denture to pop it out for. Again, it fits really good. She didn't really like me pulling on her head like that while I'm videoing it, but that's what you've got to do sometimes, right? <laughs> We've got everything now together, midlines on, occlusal planes on, our bites on, and then when we, when we look at the fit perspective relative to these things, and again, I've got it just up just a smidge here, is again, you look at it completely seated. These pictures were so hard to take to be able to get it down, but again, everything's down seated where it needs to be. And again, we've made pretty extreme changes on her to get her to this point. And when you look at it, it was one restorative visit. I gathered all the information, visit one. This is visit number two. Putting everything in and we're done. Okay, now again, with the upper, we're scanning it, you know, I'm gonna move her forward and place, place some implants, et cetera. But one restorative visit, because we've got all the data there, okay, from the stuff. All right, any questions on that one? All right, let's move on to this one. So, this, and again, I've got this one as an FP1 because I'm a big FP1 fan. I know you like FP1. I'm a huge FP1 fan because I just don't like cutting away people's faces. Um, this one came in, and this one got referred to me from one of my surgeons. And she came in, and I'm looking at her, you know, this is for the upper, and I'm looking at her going, why in the world are you here? Because I, and he's like, yeah, we're going to take everything out everything on the upper, lower keep. And I'm like, why are we doing this? <laughs> like, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not feeling this. And he's like, well, okay, go ahead and take a look at the CBCT. He's like, if you look closely, he's like, we've got an OKC up there. And so that's gonna knock out those three teeth. And he's like, well, then over here, we've got you know, this tooth and this tooth. We've got a vertical fracture on that, an endo failure on that. And he's like, she just wants them all. And I'm like, well, dude, even with these, we can take all this out. We can do a couple implants, go that way. We can keep these teeth, go that way. And he's like, patient's done. Like, he, he was kind of like, look, we're, we're doing it anyway. 
you know? <laughs> like, and I'm like, okay, well, if you're gonna do it anyway, I, I'll at least restore it. And he goes, by the way, like, I, I, so I do a lot of stackable cases, because, you know, that was kind of a new thing coming out. I mean, I'm sure everybody's probably done a stackable case or two, but I wanted to do like a ton of them to get a real feel for it, see if it was something I liked to do. And he'd never done one. He's like, hey, oh, by the way, you know, I'm gonna do it anyway, but can we do it a stackable case and we can split it? You know, you can do a half, I can do a half. And I said, well, I don't really think we should go this route, but if this is, if you guys are already going this route, like I will at least help move her in the right direction so she doesn't end up kind of a cluster. So we just follow the exact same principles, scan everything, plan everything, get everything set. Again, with the stackable case, what we're doing on this one is this was kind of a different type of stackable guide like that we were developing with one of the companies, um, with one of the labs, because one thing I hate about stackables is you've got to reflect like 9,000 feet up to get everything out of the way. Well, it's this one, we've made these little jigs that kind of move in and out like that, that bend and get put in, then we can loot everything in the middle and we don't have to, you know, you can never do this case like a stackable with an FP1 previous. And so that's what we're going to do on this particular one. So we've got our base guide, which you see, and then again, take the teeth out. And then we've got, you know, this is this little thing to kind of seat them together. Then you've got our implant guide, and then we've got our provisional, which keys into that stackable spot right through there. So let me just show principles. So we've got the base guide seated. From there, rest of the teeth are taken out. We've kind of cleared everything out that way. And again, prior to doing this, like it was going in and, and taking out the OKC. Puts on the surgical guide. Go ahead and just do guided surgery just like you've always seen. The biggest thing though with any full arch case though is you really gotta line your notches up, especially if you're using an angled abutment. Because if you've got a 30 degree, and you're a little bit off on that base, a little turn at the base swings that 30 degree really high on the top. Okay, does that make sense? That's why you've got to get them absolutely lined up from a notch perspective so that you're right kind of where things need to be because if not, you're gonna have a pretty big swing. So we go through that. Um, man, I lost my cursor. But get it all set. Again, biggest thing is getting at least a minimum torque that we can put our our uh, abutments in, we get it. Life's going pretty good. Again, the back one, I was just a little bit shy, so I didn't want to do that one. So we put everything in, pick it up, and again, here is where she leaves, okay? And it was really funny, because she came back. Usually I'll do like surgeries Monday or Tuesday, then I see patient post-op on Friday. She comes back on Friday, and she's, she's a really funny patient. This was her on the Friday. And she's like, how come nothing's hurting? Something must be wrong. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, that's a good thing. And she's like, no, it's not. Like something's horribly wrong. I know it. And I'm like, no, that's a happy, happy thing. Like just enjoy it. And she, she's kind of a little bit of a negative Nelly that way. She's like, no, something's obviously wrong. Well, let me show you something I did extremely wrong that I made a terrible decision on, okay? so. One of the implants, which was kind of a redundant implant, if you looked really closely at this view, and you probably didn't see it, it's sitting there. I mean, how good a position does that abutment look like it's in? So that's an awesome position, okay? It spun on me as I was torquing the top, okay? I'm torquing the top on, and the implant goes whoop, and I go, oh, suck. So I kind of held on to it, and like I took the top off, so this would be under the tissue, and I thought, okay, I can't get the base part out. So what I'll do is I'll just take the top off, we'll let the tissue granulate over. Once it integrates, then I'll take it off, move it over to the next hex, or get you know a non-index version, put that in and be set. Okay, good rationale, right? Hold that thought. So eight months goes by, you know, just due to a bunch of different stuff. And she comes back and she's looking like this. Okay, and she's loving the provisional. She's like, oh, my friends think this is the final. This is awesome. I'm like, good, perfect. Let's move you forward. So I'm thinking, okay, I've got this great provisional, but I still have this little friend right here. Okay, 
right in that spot. And this is where I made a very dumb decision because I thought, you know what, like look at the tissue here. Let's go back to the non-black and white. Look at that tissue. Looks good. Looks happy. We're good. But I thought, you know what, she paid for that extra implant. Let me uncover it. Let me go ahead and move it, put the abutment in on the right spot. And let me make something that I can show you guys from what not to do in a lecture, okay? So, make my terrible, terrible decision, because again, I planned the implant, twisted it here. So we go ahead and do that. I scan her, I took the provisional off, punched the side, you know, moved the implant into the, or moved the abutment, excuse me, to the right spot, went and put my scan bodies on. You know, didn't think much of it. Put something on to kind of push the tissue out of the way a little bit. Got my printed try-in back to move forward. Okay, in this one I am doing a printed try-in because again, this hasn't been part of anything up to this point. So got my printed try-in in, put it in, and oh, suck. That's looking awesome. And this is her smile. Yes. Yeah, see, that's the groan I like to hear when I show this. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, you idiot. <laughs> but we all do this, right? Like, and I'm going, oh, shoot. And she gets the mirror, and she goes, what's this? <laughs> and I'm like, and I said, that's a bad decision on my part. And she's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, look, I had this little voice in my said, head that said, don't uncover it. Just bury that sucker and call it good. But, I, and it, again, I'm just straight up telling this to the lady that I said, but I didn't listen to that voice. I thought, you paid for it. I'm going to uncover this and connect this. And I said, frankly, I made the wrong clinical decision. I shouldn't have done that. And she's like, well, what are you going to do about it? I'm like, nothing. You're going to go around like this forever. She's like, what? I'm like, no, I'm just kidding you. We're going to do some stuff with it. <laughs> so what I did is I took this back out. I took out the abutment, I put just a, a uh, cover screw on it, and then what I did is I, I, again, pushed the coping out of the provisional. And again, this is how it looked. I mean, look at how it looked before I screwed it up. So it looked great before. So what I did, and again, the problem was, in this particular software, you couldn't actually plan the true abutments, so I just had a cylinder morphed to what would be the true abutment, but that actually didn't represent it because look at how tight it's coming off at 30 degrees. And the reality is it's much bigger than that. I should have gone a uni abutment. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this one is too angled for a uni. But I just shouldn't have done that. So again, what I did is I pushed it out, I put the healing abutment on, and then I went and and contoured this back, under contoured it so we can get the tissue to go down. And then I said, I'll see you in about six weeks. So she comes back in six weeks. Oh, there's a fly right there. Looking better. Again, it's come down some, but again, I would need to recontour that a little bit better. So at this point, I'm like, okay, I'm feeling pretty good with the soft tissue contours. Went ahead, scanned the provisional in the mouth, scanned the soft tissue. And then what I also did is, and I do this very frequently, especially with FP1s, is I'll take the provisional in my hand and I scan the whole thing, okay? Because you've spent all this time with an FP1 developing all these beautiful pontics. Well, let's use that information, okay? So I can go ahead and take that information. We can go ahead and combine it with our different scans so that all this stuff fits right in here. And the reason why this is important, and again, this is, we've got another paper on this as well that's going to be coming out. When you look at what soft tissue does, and again, this is much more apparent in, in a single, is when you take off a healing abutment or a provisional, what does the tissue do? It goes bleh. It falls, right? But we really don't know how much it falls or anything like that. And so what we've done is we've started to quantify it. And the beautiful thing is if you scan your provisional in, you can merge it back so that the lab can see exactly where those contours used to be. And so when we look at the contours of everything, we can see that, again, just in literally the time it takes to take the provision off and you just start scanning it, it's already collapsed almost a millimeter when you look at it from the two sides. And so again, from the lab side, they truly are kind of guessing where things used to be. 
That's why when you go ahead and scan in your provisional, they can see the exact contours that used to be there. And what you can then do is, again, go through the different things which you change. The patient says, you know, it's a little bit too tight here. I'm having a hard time getting floss underneath. So we're going to take that, that part of the intaglio surface, decrease that a little bit. She says she wants it bulked up a little bit there because she's like, I'm getting a little bit of food in there. I say, okay, we're going to bulk that out. And then she says, you know, I want the... Well, luckily she doesn't say, I want the buccal corridor brought out, because if she says that, you're screwed. You know, like, <laughs> I want the buccal corridor brought out. You go, you need to see my associate, because you know too much, you know. But she says, she says, you know, I want the site kind of brought out a little bit, so we're going to bring that part out facially. So from the laboratory side, again, we've got all these different things we can bring into this. Again, we've got our scan bodies, we've got our provisional scanned in, so we can follow these contours, and then we've got our final design there. Jack goes ahead and designs this, mills it out for me, characterize it, characterizes it, gets it all set. And then again, this is the great thing about following those contours is when you go to actually put this sucker in and you're sliding it in, we don't have blanching because we've copied that, that, those contours exactly. Okay, that's the wonderful thing about it. So here it is at delivery. Here's my buried friend that gave me trouble. And then again, here she was. This was almost, I think, just shy of the two-year mark right before I moved. So she wanted to see me like right before I left because she was loving her prosthesis. So again, different way to do it, different thing to recover from that, again, I screwed up. All right, patient number three. Doesn't this make everybody feel like homey seeing this nice Christmas picture? <laughs> So, and there's a reason why I put this up, because how this fit, and again, this is third patient, very different presentation than the rest, okay? The reason that this third patient was coming in is because how she spent her Christmas was very different than how we spent our Christmases, okay? We spent our Christmases like this. She was out in the, the beach, you know, the coast with her family. They rented a place out there. And basically what had happened is she had a metal acrylic made by someone else. And what had happened was you can kind of see the remnants is she broke off her front two teeth on, I can't remember if it was Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. And I'm like, there's a song about that, you know? And she was just mad. I'm like, too soon, I understand. <laughs> like, but she blew out her front two teeth on, again, Christmas or Christmas Eve, and it took her I think she said it took her like six days to be able to find anybody that could kind of spackle her back together. So she basically spent the whole holiday with no front teeth. And that wasn't the only issue she had with her conventionally made metal acrylic. In just that one year, in, she'd blown out that tooth as well, and she actually blew out those two as well. And so in just a one year time, she had three problems, and the year before that, she'd actually blown all six out at once, okay? And when you look at that, you say, well, holy crap, that poor lady. But the reality is, if you look at the data relative to where we are with metal acrylics, conventionally metal-wrapped acrylic with carded teeth, what you see is, again, it's this nice paper by Popsididakis. At 10 years, you only have a 9% chance of being complication-free. That's it, okay? you have a 91% chance of having an issue. And what most of those issues are, are teeth popping off, okay? I don't think, when I lived in Charleston, I don't think I would have a single week where I didn't have something either ending up in my practice or ending up in my residence practices of teeth, pop, not of teeth popping off of a conventionally made metal acrylic. So that's why she got referred to me is because Someone told her, yeah, this guy can make you one that teeth don't pop off with. And she comes in and says, can you do this? I said, yeah, we can make some monolithic types of things for you. And so again, when we look at her, again, you can start to see some of the problems. These have been spackled together so many times. You know, these kind of teeth are out waving a little bit. You can see kind of some of the staining that goes on from spackling, and she broke some of the lower ones in together. At this particular point, we're only going to redo the upper for her. And with this, we're going to use bridge base in two different ways. We're going to do what I like to call the fully monolithic, which is going zirconia over the bar. And the reason why I'm doing bar with the zirconia is because I think I've probably got in any here. You'll see she's only got these four implants and the AP spread's not great, okay? 
I don't want just this big hunk of zirconia going back on a cantilever by itself, okay? I want it supported with, with the bar. And then we're doing the modular monolithic where we're going to print out the gums and print out, or actually mill the teeth in this particular one. Workflow's the same as you've seen before, just a couple of the little nuances are this, okay? This right here is worth the whole price of admission if you haven't ever done this before. With the opposing arch, go ahead and mark the things with articulating paper, okay? Go tap, 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 tap. Then scan the patient because, again, everything scans in color. You can get the marks. And then what you do is when you get to the occlusal tab after you've scanned everything, you can verify that your marks are the exact same on that as what you captured. Because that way you have a verified bite before the patient actually leaves your chair, okay? And with her, I said, does it only feel like you're biting kind of on the one side? She's like, yeah, I only bite on my right side. I can't really get much on the left side. I, I'm like, you want to bite over there, right? She's like, yeah, I'd love to bite on both sides. I said, perfect. We will build that into this as well. So again, takes five extra seconds, but actually pays big dividends with your restorative work later on, okay? Now, just from some nuance perspective, again, because we're doing an upper on this one versus the lower, which I showed you before, Make sure you get back kind of tuberosity regions. Make sure you get the palatal tissue. And then from a facial perspective, when you're scanning the facial, I always have an obturgate in, and then I just kind of have the patient almost close. That way it kind of creates some space for my scanner to go through and scan that facial tissue, okay? So at this point, all of this stuff is going over to my lab. Okay, again, same deal. This one's, again, one visit and then restored on the second one. Because again, we're using this as our digital wax rim. You can see again, those are the four implants that were placed. Doesn't go back very far. That's why, again, I'm putting in a bar is because, and again, she's got, you know, low sinuses. Whoever did it didn't really put a whole heck of a lot of thought, just kind of slammed the four implants in and called it a good day, okay? So let's start off with the modular monolithic. Okay, we've got our bar, we've got the pre-op scan, we're making all of our adjustments relative to the pre-op scan. She wanted teeth a little bit longer, wanted things shifted over a little bit. And again, we've got our designs. Just like the other one, we're gonna print out the gums. That sounds weird, doesn't it? We're gonna print out your gums. <laughs> print out the gums, go ahead and mill the teeth, cut the sprues off and put everything together that way. The zirconia monolithic one is this. Okay, same exact principle designed Again, just from a standard zirconia and finished. Again, here it is in its raw form. Go ahead and again, that's when you're going to make all your characterizations are in the raw form. From there, go ahead and center it. And again, Jack's done a wonderful job with this. Centers it. We're big fans of Mio porcelain, so that's how we do the pink. This is just the Mio kind of body portion. And then we've got structure, Mio structure over the top. And again, makes this beautiful, beautiful prosthesis. And guess what? He doesn't even have the bar yet. Okay, he's made it while the bar is being shipped over. So we get the bar from Atlantis. And again, you figure, he put a lot of work into this sucker. Okay, before he's even got the piece yet to make it fit. And again, this is the result of when we get it to fit. So he gets it. And again, we got two bars made because we were trying out both. And again, it was just a duplicated bar. But he opens it up, pops it out. That's the sexiest sound in dentistry right there, <laughs> okay? Passively just boom, seats, seats right in. Now, you get the bar on the other one, again, and this one goes in, similar passivity, just a little bit tighter, okay? And, and again, that has to do with differences in tolerances from a manufacturing perspective, okay? Same exact bar. But anyway, glues them both together. We've got our modular monolithic and our fully monolithic. I'm first trying in the plastic one because I know she's going to like the Zerk one better, okay? <laughs> like 100%. I'm like, all right, we're going to try this one in first because there's no way you're getting this one back out of your mouth once I put that one in, okay? So get the plastic one, put the plastic one in. Again, we've got a nice fit. We've got a decent look for plastic. Again, passive fit going down. Again, I, I can't have you guys fill it as I'm screwing it in, but again, passive fit going in. And again, it's plastic. It looks fine, but again, the Zerk is a friggin' work of art, right? Like, that's why I'm like, I'm putting this one in first, and we're unscrewing this, and now we're putting this other one in. So we put the fully monolithic one in, the Zerk. Again, nice look, <coughs> excuse me, 
from the smile perspective. Put everything in, again, nice fit, good adaptation. We've got a wonderful fit from this perspective. You know, everything seats down onto it. And I think the best way that I can kind of show you that everything is coming together correctly is this was the bite right out of the gate. Bing, 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 bing. All I had to do was adjust that just a little bit and that just a little bit. It literally was 10 seconds of adjustment. And she goes, oh, perfect. Then I can touch over here now. And I'm like, right, that's the point. So, but again, all of that, and again, that's the second restorative visit. No trying, no models, no verification jig, no anything, okay? Fully digital. Now, any questions on that? All right, you all just want to see me screw up, right? Okay, so sorry, I've got this here because it's like I don't know if I'm going to have a chance to go through this. So I call this best case, worst case, okay? And this is, you know, for those of you that went to IFF, this is kind of where this thing has come from, is from actually this case, and this is our brainchild. Because what you, what you see, and again, I'm, I'm end, I've showed you all this pretty stuff, and I'm ending just with, I, I should have not ended with a bad one, but I'm ending with a bad one. But when you look at these cases, and, and we go to CE, sometimes this is what we see, is we see, here's where she started, and this is where she started, and look at what we did. We got her to hear, high five, it was awesome, life's good. And, and that's all you ever see a lot of the time, right? But you don't see the long, freaking sucky road that it took to get there. And that's what I'm going to show you because we're all clinicians, okay? We've all had this case, okay? So let me show you. I could have called this every which way in which you can screw up a double arch case because that could be the other title for, for this particular one. So let's take a look. So she came in. Again, here's her smile. Here's her retracted. And she's 29 years old. She's actually coming in with her folks because her folks are going to fund this. And she's been, I'm probably the fifth consult of different groups, okay? 29 years old. Every group has said standard FP3 buckle shelf, slick everything, cut everything way up, do conventional metal acrylic. And I'm looking at this girl going, she's almost 30. There's no way I'm going to cut your face off. Like, you're too young, because if I cut everything off now, what are we going to do in 20 years when things fell? We're out of space, <laughs> like when you do this. So I was like, look, can that be done? You bet. But for me, there's no way, because things fell, and you have problems, and I, I want to have some backup of bone if things go south. And so I said, you know, what I would recommend is, you know, doing four three-unit bridges on top of implants, three four-unit bridges on the lower, okay, with, all with implants. They were game with that idea, so perfect. So we go ahead and scan the patient. I design all my teeth. So how in the world do you get from here to here, okay? And there's a couple ways. Again, if we looked at it, and again, we haven't seen all of them today, but you can do a mucosal, you know, take everything out, do a mucosal supported guide, take everything out, slick everything, and put a bone supported guide on, do a stackable. Well, when you look at these things and you look at the data relative to these things, what you see is, again, the problem with mucosal supported guides when you're taking everything out is all of a sudden things get a little squirrely because of the deviations, okay? Because you no longer have, the only good supporting structure you have anymore is the palate. So your guide's got to sit on that, and the guide's not exactly as stable. When you look at bone-supported guides, again, non-optimal placement due to the malposition of the bone. I know everyone that's done a bone-supported guide, sometimes you're like, is it here or here? You kind of have to use your spidey sense to like get that thing shimmed in correctly sometimes. And then when you look at, you know, and again, there's a bunch of other papers that show the same thing. When you look at stackables, there's almost no peer review data on these things, like none. And that was one of the reasons why we set out to do a ton of these so we could start generating some, some data on these things. And when you look at kind of what type of guide is better according to the literature, whether it's tooth, bone born, mucosal born, if you look at Turbish's paper, this is probably the best one, again, verified by a bunch of these others. Tooth born guides are actually the best, okay? And the great thing about on a patient like this being able to do some sort of tooth born guide is after we put the implants in, if they don't torque for whatever reason, 
you, don't, you haven't committed them to a denture right out of the gate, okay? Like you've still got some teeth to work with and play with. So what I try to do is I try to find some teeth that are not where I want my implants so that I can take out kind of everything else and keep them so that my guide will sit on those teeth. And then again, if it don't, doesn't torque, then I can go ahead and prep those teeth real quick. And if you look at Collie's paper, what you see is you need at least four teeth left over to maximize the accuracy. You start to get less than that, the guide starts to get a little squirrely with things, okay? So that's what we're going to do. So I'm gonna start showing you my very first error. Again, you've already seen kind of like removing teeth. Now with this, let me just click through this quick. There's kind of two ways to do it. You can do it the digilog where you print it out and cut things off and get dust all over your hands like I did here and go that way. Or you can do it digitally, which again is what I prefer. And again, this is her case. On that particular one, I was using mesh mixer just to get rid of some of the teeth. And this is where I first screwed up. So I made my first model, went and merged it with my CBCT, only to realize that I didn't want number three left, I actually wanted number two left. And I'm like, suck, so I've gotta go back and do it again. And then I merged this model, then I went, and I forgot to get the canine out of there. <laughs> so third time, I've got it, finally. I'm like, all right, I've got it, got everything merged. We've got everything merged in here. So we can know where we're going with our idealized teeth. This one, again, this is, I was telling you, Michael, I was doing unis on this one. Going with unis all in here, gonna be a great case. We've got all planned according to our implants and our abutments. You analyze the space, kind of, we go through our four A's, abutments, then adequate space. We've got plenty of good space for kind of a standard FP1 fixed case, and then again, making sure they're all aligned, everything's kind of coming through like a picket fence where we want it to be, okay? So we do all those different things. Go ahead and order our core files. Same exact thing which you've kind of seen before. I merge this all up, design my provisionals, and again, here's my provisionals on some printed models. We've got these little struts to kind of hold it there to go to kind of stable areas. And we're looking pretty good. So we're gonna start off with the upper surgery. This is done by one of my colleagues. We go into this, take out the teeth. We're kind of at this stage. We put the guide on, put the guide in. And again, we plan two 5.4s. So everybody, what's your guided protocol for a 5.4? There isn't one. We all know this, right? And that's the problem. So you've got to go 4-8 and freehand the last one and then put your 5-4 in. Again, I wanted some 5-4s in the back. So we go ahead and do that. And at this point, so all the implants are in and those teeth are there. And my dean had come up to me before and he's like, look, there is some VIPs that you need to meet. And I'm like, dude, I can't meet him. I'm in the middle of something big here. And he's like, I'm not asking, I'm telling you. Like these people want to talk. And I'm like, well, I don't care. I'm in a freaking OR. And he's like, I'll bring them to the OR. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So I'm in there. We're at the point where all the implants are in. My, my, my buddy, the surgeon goes, hey, you want me to take out all the teeth? I said, go ahead and just torque test. If everything feels good, take the teeth out. I see, he says, perfect. So I say, excuse me. You know, I get out of all my garb, go outside, meet with these friggin' people for like 20 minutes come back in, and all the teeth are gone, okay? And so, and again, just imagine the abutments aren't here yet. So I start going around, and on this one over here, he's like, oh, I, by the way, I perfed the sinus, so we can't use that one, you know, with his freehanded drill. And I said, okay, no problem. I'm gonna start kind of putting on my abutments. So I start putting on my abutments, and I'm, I'm going, bink, that works well, bink, that works well. I get over here, this one completely spins. Like if I just went, that thing would like do like a 1080, you know? I'm like, oh, suck. Yeah, I can't really do a whole lot with that. Then I get over to here and that one's spitting at 15 and I'm like, oh, shoot. Because that's a terminal one. And I'm like, uh-oh. Then I'm like, they'll all be splinted, carry on. And then I've only done this once ever. So I've got these parts. I've got my temporary coping. Again, the temporary coping looks a little bit different, but this is the screenshot that I could for it. Anybody see the part that I forgot to order? The screw. The screw. Yeah, glad somebody knows this because I didn't it that day, apparently. 
I forgot to order this stupid screw. So I go to convert it and I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot to order the screws. So I go running back up to my stash of stuff. There's a number of implants and I don't have enough screws. And I'm just like furious at myself at this point. So I call my rep. 24 hours later, she sends me all the screws. Got the patient back the next day. Did the conversion on the top. And uh, you know, feel like I totally missed a putt because just wait. I got blood stuck in the conversion right there. Just wait on that. It looks awesome in a little bit. <laughs> so this was in December. Saw her back in January. Myself and one of my residents did the lower. Um, same deal, got the case to here, put the guide on, drilled everything in, put it in. I mean, the great thing about these Simplant guides is they fit so tight that like you can put the guide on after the fact and just squeeze it really tight and like yoink out all the teeth. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That isn't what actually happened. <laughs> but I, you guys are like, holy crap, that did fit tight. But that wasn't what happened at all. I, like, I was putting on the, the abutments and I looked over and one of my other residents was sitting there. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, check it out. And he put all the teeth <laughs> back in the guide, which I thought was pretty funny. So I had to snap that picture of it. So do that. Again, put the, put the abutments on. You know, again, all these torque, put the abutments on, put the temporary copings on, just slid this over, picked it up. And you can see how awesome that's starting to look now with that blood. This is again a month later. Here she is post-op. I think this was a week later and I just couldn't take it anymore. So I, I cut in from the lingual side and cut out that blood and then filled it back in with composite because I was like, this just looks like crap. And again, like we've made some pretty good progress. Like we're feeling pretty good about ourselves and she's feeling great about herself. Time goes on a few months down the road and I get this call from her that says, you know, I'm, it's filling loose. Where do you think it's feeling loose, guys? <coughs> what side? Upper left, right? So I said, is it the upper left? She's like, yeah, how'd you know? I'm like, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> I'm like, why don't you come on in? So she comes in, we snap an x-ray, blown out. So I, I call down, you know, two floors down to my, my buddy. I said, look, that one's shot. And he's like, well, we're too busy right now. I said, okay. So I cut the provisional right here. I took this out, you know, got her to this point. And I said, look, I think number 11 shot too. And I said, you know, go in. He's like, hey, we'll get her back. We'll place a new implant there. And I said, well, when you do that, you know, place it just the next spot over. I said, when you do that, check number 11. You know, because again, this is, this is our beautiful thing with our uni. And he says, okay. So they put another one in, you know, right here. I don't have a film or anything. This is the one that came out. He said, oh yeah, everything's fine with 11. I'm like, okay. So she goes away. Now, just one thing, the temptation when you have something like this is to go ahead and just take the whole provisional off. Don't do that, okay? Especially you've got to remember in the second to fourth week, there's rapid and intense resorption. If you take it off, you've got a problem if your provisional breaks, okay? So don't take it off during that time. Two to three month mark, be very careful if something does break during this time, like we've got a fracture there. What I basically do is I cut a little trough in there, connect it back just still in the mouth. And then what I do is I usually put rib on or something there to loot it back together. Okay. If I've got something that breaks. So, so time passes and then she calls again. It feels weird. And I'm like, so the upper left, she's like, yeah, get her back. That puppy shot, goodbye number 11. We've got this big Excalibur that's now taken out, which is a real bummer. Now, he took it out, grafted the site, coming back to battle a different time. Now, why did these fail? Honestly, if you look at the data, I mean, data shows immediate placement works pretty well. Bottom line is, again, I just, I don't think they were quite in the bone well enough. And then being distal extensions of this big thing, it's kind of ramming it. And I just think that's probably what went on. Now, what would I have done different in this part, knowing that these friends didn't torque? If I had known that, what we would have done is at this stage right here, I would have done the same thing that I do on this other patient here. I would have just prepped these for a fixed provisional and put her in a fixed provisional, like on teeth, okay? Which is again, same deal on this guy. Like I took out all but these four teeth, put him in this nice fixed provisional while I bone grafted and everything healed. And again, then you can just 
take this out, come back and battle a different day, you know? And again, that's what I did, but we didn't have the option. We get back to business, another implant's placed. They couldn't place it in the 11 site because it was just too blown out. So time goes on. At this point, she's like, about a year's gone on at this point. And she's like, I want a new provisional because I want longer teeth. I said, perfect. So I make her longer teeth. <laughs> looks great, retracted, it looks like horse teeth from in front. So I made her these terrible horse teeth, which I'm just like, what am I doing to this person? <laughs> and like, I get her set there, and then a month after that, finally, and now we're about a year and a half in, finally she breaks something on the lower. And I'm like, okay, no problem, you just broke that section off, no problem. So I say, okay, I'm gonna make a new lower mill provisional to set you up for the final. Make a new lower mill provisional, put that in. <laughs> a couple weeks later, she comes back because she's broken now the upper. Again, I was like, okay, we're gonna make you a new provisional on top. We're gonna make you the finals on the lower and go from there. So scan it, scan it. I think we're at the end of the, you know, the lights at the end of the tunnel. We're probably honestly about two plus years in at this point. And I'm feeling pretty good. Like you can see the light, right? Well, then she calls and says, all my lower teeth fell out. <laughs> and I'm like, what? She comes in, everything debonded off of the temp cylinders. Like absolutely massive adhesive failure. And if you look at milled PMMA, again, we don't really have time to do this, but it's very inert. So you've got to do stuff to prepare it well. So I spackle them all back together. So again, just make sure they're treated well. So I spackle them back together. Finally, we get the final lowers and then the upper full arch provisional. And it, it's because we we're doing bridge base on a couple of these. So I like switched it to conventional, like I took out the unis and, and switched it to actual bridge bases, or not bridge bases, excuse me, custom base on these because we're going kind of to fixed, a fixed solution. Um, and again, I could have gone to multis or gone to the unis on all of them, but I just was like, you know what? I want a big screw, I want X, Y, and Z. I don't want that interface. So we're going this route. And he ordered, my lab guy ordered the, the multi, or the freak, I keep calling it the wrong thing, the uh, custom base for the wrong thing. That's why we've got this that's still missing one. But anyway, put it in, life's good, lower's good, top, I'm pretty happy with in the provisional. We've done what we should do, like, like this is what we pride ourselves as prosthodontists, like work it all in the provisional till you get it perfect. I've got it to where I'm happy. So I call up Lee and I said, Lee, make me this exact thing. Again, we've got a pretty good bite from the full digital perspective. He says, okay, and I get this back in the mail and I'm like, well, this bridge is right, this bridge is right. This is actually supposed to be, you know, sectioned right in the middle, but I'm like, oh, whatever. Like, it's fine. And again, at this point, we're probably just under three years in and I'm screwing it in and this is supposed to be the happiest day of all of our lives. And as I'm screwing it in, I'm feeling just sick because I get it in and that's what it now looks like. Okay. He completely, and I don't get mad. You know, again, this is like my provisional. This is what Lee built me. And again, I, my assistants know, like if I go jet quiet in the room, like I'm pissed. I was just like silent. You could hear like a ting, you know, of like anything hitting the ground. So I, like after I put it in, you know, she's taking the mirror, I walk out and I called my lab guy. I'm like, what in the world did you do? We had it perfect. All you had to do is put the file back in, in Zerk. And he's like, well, I decided to redo it. And I said, no, go back, remake this for me. And so she, I'm like, what do you think? And the patient's like, yeah, I like it. And I'm like, you're just over it because you've been doing this for so long. And she's like, no, I, I, I like it. I'm like, I'm making you a new one anyway. Make the new one anyway. It comes back as a full bridge. I'm like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? So it comes back in. I call the patient. Guess what? She like disappears off the face of the earth. So it was sitting there forever like this in the box until I pulled it out because I, I gave this part of the lecture for Amos implant a couple of years ago, like two years ago. And I was taking out this to make these pictures and you know I've got a little black background because that's what we do and I bumped it with my leg and I broke the bridge <laughs> <laughs> taking the freaking picture of it 
so I was like, but at this point, it's like, it's like a couple of years after the fact, and I'm like, whatever. Like, I, we tried to call her a million times. She never comes back. Finally, I think this was four years after the fact, she finally came back in. And again, everything was looking pretty good. Everything was stable. She was just moving to Texas. So she's like, yeah, I figure I never came back. I want you to just look at it before I leave. I'm like, you couldn't have come in four years ago. But again, we've got, again, nice results. Again, I still don't love the looks of this, but she's, she's been pretty happy. Again, I really wish that I think this would have looked much, you know, this was when we delivered it. Again, a little bit different lighting in the cameras, but again, she's, she's stable, but you can see like all this run into problems, guys. Like, and just because we're, we're talk, you know, speaking about this stuff doesn't mean we, we don't run into problems because we all do, but I think we can learn from these things. So anyway, sorry for running over. Again, just remember, these are all the different kind of cool things. Remember the three two, the three A's, and the different ways to execute it. If anybody's got any questions, you know, it's just mark.ludlow at hsc.utah.edu. If you're ever out to Utah and want to go skiing or whatever, come let me know. You can come by the U and we can... You know, you can write it off or whatever your trip. But, uh, but I appreciate, you know, the offer. You know, Martin and Dent Supply, thank you guys so much for having me. You know, it's been great being with you all. You know, if anybody's got any questions, come find me tonight because, like I say, I'm already 10 minutes over, so I apologize for that. But thank, thank you very much for having me.